Hey, Clayton. Hi, everyone. Hi. Welcome. Hey. Thank you. We'll be getting started shortly. All right, it's six o'clock, so we're going to begin. Hello everyone, my name is Clayton Smith. I am chair of the Parks and Public Spaces Committee for Community Board 5. This is a joint committee meeting with the Landmarks Committee. Uh, I do not yet see Layla on the call, if I'm not mistaken. You are right. But I, we will be joined shortly by Layla Lagasico, who's chair of the Landmarks Committee. We also have chair of the board, Vicky Barbero, who just joined us. Hi, Vicky. And right before we begin, uh, our first item is actually a park specific informational item from the uh, Parks Department regarding public art installation in Union Square Park. We thank you all who are in attendance presenting for that uh, quick informational presentation. This is not a voting item. After that, we will move into the four presentations from Central Park Conservancy, which are the joint committee agenda. Two, we expect two of those items to be voting items, uh, and those will be the ones we hear first. Before we begin in earnest, I've just gotten notification that the new board members for CB5 have been appointed and might well be on the call now. I, the names I have are Noah Stern, Joseph Frewer, and Jamie Kang. So I'd love to um, welcome you. And if each of you would like to just briefly say, say hi and introduce yourself to the board, that would be great. Uh, maybe Noah, are you on? Yes, I am. Hi, my name is um, Noah Stern. And I just want to say um, hello to um, everyone. And I'm uh, excited to be a part of um, CP5. So thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Joseph Frewer, are you here? Hi. Uh, yes, I just figured out uh, how to turn my camera on. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Joseph Frewer. Um, also just got the news um, on, I guess that was yesterday. Uh, so I'm also happy to be here. Welcome. Thanks. And Jamie Kang, are you on? Not yet. Not yet. She'll be joining us. She, he. I don't know. Will be joining us. So welcome. It will be an interesting experience to give you all an orientation and get you up to speed on Zoom. We've definitely never done that before, but there is a first time for everything in this experience. So uh, without further ado, we will move into the Union Square Public Art Installation presentation. Uh, Elizabeth, are you going to take the lead on that? Sorry, yeah, sorry, I was on mute. No problem. Um, Take so I have away. a presentation I can share on my screen. Great. Well, actually, I'll show you one. Well, let's start with this. Um, are you able to see here? Yep, looks good. Great. So this is a uh, the temporary public art installation for Union Square. And it'll be in the triangle at the southeast corner of the park where the last thing we had there was the Chihuly sculpture. Uh, it looked like a giant rock candy um, tower. Um, so this artwork will be going there. Originally we had planned for the summer um, with things the way they are. All of our temporary public art projects are currently um, on hold. So we are hopeful to have this installed later this year, um, optimistically August, September, but we're all being flexible um, where needed just in terms of um, public safety. And, you know, we just want it to be safe for everyone and 
hopefully once it's there, it'll bring a smile to people's faces. Um, this is, um, so the title of the sculpture is Holding Hands and it's um, an international public sculpture project from the artist Stick. Um, there will be a permanent one permanently installed in London in August, 2020. Um, this is a popular and recognized and well-loved um, motif from the artist um, Ouvre. Um, you might actually recognize some of the work. I'll show you some slides where you can see the artist's work um, as it appeared in other places in the city. Um, it's going to be a 13 foot high uh, bronze sculpture with a granite plinth. Um, so here's um, an example of the artist's work in London. Uh, this one, I believe is, I looked it up before. It's, I don't know the location correctly. It, it's down in Lower East Side at Delancey and Allen Street. Um, the one here on the right or left, sorry, will look familiar to those of you who live near Union Square. Um, that is on a water tower that you'll actually be able to see from the site where the sculpture is going to be installed if you look south. Um, so I think it's around 4th Avenue and 13th Street. So look up next time you're there. Um, the motif grew out of this um, project here for uh, London Pride. And this is a called the Hackney Pride Banner. It was a 79 by 56 inch banner with the two figures. It's now, um, I believe, at an LGBTQ center in Los Angeles. Um, this other mural here was down um, in Little Italy. Um, might be familiar to some of you down there too. It was a collaboration with another artist named LA2. Um, so here's a mock-up of the sculpture that will be in Hoxton Square, very similar to the one that you'll see in Union Square. Um, here's some details about the sculpture. Um, we're still determining some of the weights for the plinth, um, and I can share that if you'd like. It will be substantially heavy, but there will be engineering to ensure safety and stability. Um, there's our general timeline there. Um, it's still in production, but yeah, we're hoping August, September. Um, and here's some uh, mock-ups of it here in production. Um, so those are most of the details. Um, this is also being supported by the Lisa Project, which is a nonprofit organization um, that does uh, public art. Um, LISA stands for Little Italy Street Art Project, but now they've branched out to larger areas of Lower Manhattan. So I know Union Square is kind of on the cusp of maybe what people would consider Lower Manhattan, but we just thought it was a great location for it, um, especially now more than ever. Super cool. Thank you, Elizabeth. It's, uh, I'm curious if the original plan was for the London and New York installations to be at the same time or when you said August that was always the plan in London? I believe um, maybe uh, the artist representative might be able to say something um, but I think I don't know if the London plans change because of what's going on as well. Just curious if that was synchronous or not intentionally. Um, well, um, well yeah me and Stick can both speak to that. Um, I think yeah, we, we, we were looking at doing them possibly together, but I think now because of the current situation and everything that's happening right now, it's going to be easier to get London done first and then to work on the New York one. Yeah. Um, and they're both, both sculptures are being produced at the moment in the foundry. Yeah, I, I initially guys, hi, this is Wayne Rader with the Lisa Project Public Art Charity. There was always a hope that this was going to coincide with Pride, um, the end of June. I know that that was always Stick's hope and Richard's hope, but obviously with the situations happening in both of our countries, um, things keep getting nudged up a little bit more. And the idea with the sculpture, especially in Union Square, we'd like to introduce it in a time where it's safe and it makes sense as a way to add to whatever the city's going to do when opening up again, you know, bringing pride back, bringing back um, that sense of community uh, that sense of careful closeness um, 
so that's that's one of the reasons why also I think that the the, st- the sculptures being at the same time pride was a convenient idea but um at least the project scale owned and operated but um but now I think Richard and Stick just want to make sure that it's done in a safe uh in a safe manner um overall yeah I appreciate that context yeah. I mean we are very grateful that you are able to be responsive to circumstances as they unfold. And certainly whenever the time comes that it is safe to have the installation, I can't imagine a more appropriate and um, suitable and touching artwork to be in a public space uh, given the isolation and everything that's happening this year. So um, thank you very much for this information. I'd love to open the floor for committee members if you would use the raise hand feature if anyone has any questions about the installation. I can share a map just to show you where it is i don't people we've also, also just done a mock-up of the sculpture as it will look in union square that i can share we just got that today yeah and you also have the artist stick is with us as well uh community board five uh, honorable members uh so if you have any questions for the artist please do uh don't hesitate so I'm sharing the map here just so you can see where it is. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it is going to be in this triangle here where we've had sculpture before. Any other questions for members of the committee? Uh, I have a, it's Miriam. Hi, Miriam. Hi, I just have a question, I guess, for the artist. I'm just curious to know if they're two-sided, these figures. Yes, I can show you an actual, I can show you uh, a You mock-up. might just need to come off the share screen, just, just oh. uh, because I think Stick's trying to show you something in his studio. Yeah, there you I go. I can show you, this is going to be noisy. <laughs> so this is, this is a mock-up of, uh, this is a, a quarter size mock-up. So yes, it is very much two-sided. Thank you. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, it's a uh, yeah. The sculpture it, itself uh, is going to be bronze as well. It's going to be in bronze. Uh, this is this is actually a mock-up. It's actually in steel. Um, Richard has a. Uh, There's a, a mock-up. mock-up here. This is a this is a rough mock-up of the uh, location. Um, Gorgeous. Yeah, it, it will be. It, it's in. It's in patinated bronze. So the uh, the faces and the body are in in bronze, and the black outlines and the eyes are in uh, a, a natural black plat- patination. So it's a very uh, it's a very organic process, and we. I chose to use bronze because of the fine art tradition of using bronze and just as a nod to uh, tradition. It, it's going to look much nicer than the render as well. That's, uh, that's, used, that's made using kind of automobile rendering software. So it looks very shiny. It's, and the base is going to be granite. So it's, it's going to be a very sort of, it's going to be composed of very natural materials and be very tactile. It was very, this, this, this uh, mock-up was uh, just produced today for the purpose of this meeting, but obviously, yeah, it will be, uh, it will be a a solid granite base and uh, this patinated bronze. But this gives you an idea of the location. We're looking down onto, um, ooh. This is, I I do want to chime in and also introduce my colleague, uh, Alison Sokoloff who's director of, de- uh, of business for us, um, the business development for the Lisa Project. This piece is going to be, a, um, we like to think instantly iconic, especially when it comes to the thought and the process of the opening of uh, the reopening of New York. I know we touched on that a moment ago, but that is such an important uh, theme and feeling right now between both countries. Uh, Stick, is based, Stick and Richard are both based in, UK, in the UK and they're going through their crisis currently um as we slowly inch past ours so i just feel the two countries coming together the sculpture in that manner and being in an area which is such a gateway kind of vibe to it where you can see it walking driving heading to the subway um i hope the board is excited about this and if there are any other questions 
that they have, I would uh, I would please uh, encourage you to uh, to ask us. Thank you so much, Wayne. Uh, I'll, I'll encourage any committee members who have questions to use the raise hand feature. Uh, normally with situations like this with presentations on public art, of course we do not take a vote because we are not in the business of voting on aesthetic uh, impact of artwork. Um, but we appreciate your appearing here. We think it's a really suitable uh, artwork for this space and applaud you for being flexible as to how it gets carried out. We can't wait to see it and look forward to, to it coming to Union Square. We We're excited to uh, share this with you and, and, and to have the support of the board and, and, and to share it with everybody, the entire city. So I'm sorry, so, someone was speaking. We do have a what question from Todd. What's that? Todd, can you unmute yourself? Unmute yourself. Yeah. It looks great. I echo uh, and second all of Clayton's comments. In fact, it looks so good with the reappearance of so much graffiti around the city or in our district. I'm just wondering, is it graffiti proof? Is, uh, is, is yeah. it if it was marred by graffiti? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And the, the charity, Lisa Project, NYC Charity, will be maintaining the monthly uh, cleaning, whether it's power washing or just, you know, good old fashioned, you know, brass uh, polish. <laughs> um, we'll, uh, we're going to take care of this one like it's our baby. Um, we couldn't be more honored to uh, to bring this to all, all of you and to be able to work with Stick and Richard um, and Parks for that matter. So um, so no, she'll be a he, they'll they'll <laughs> there's no designation. They'll be a beauty uh, through, through the duration. So they're going to take good care of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, Thank it's, you so much. We will we will, go, we will go visit in person as soon as we're able to and take selfies for you guys. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, and I can also just give you just a real quick update on another project I presented last year for Park Avenue. Um, if you were wondering, that's been postponed till next year. Till next year entirely. Okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, everyone. We are going to move forward with the joint agenda. I want to thank again uh, everybody from Lisa and the artists and artist reps who yeah. were here on the call. We we can't wait to see this. Thanks again for your thanks time. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. So we're going to move forward with the joint agenda. Before we do that, is Jamie Kang on the call? Yes, I'm on the call. Yes, if you'd like to introduce yourself, we are welcoming the new board members who are on the call tonight. OK, one second. Let me turn on my video. Hi, everyone. My name is Jamie. Um, I live in Midtown East, and I'm currently um, on, in the line for Whole Foods. So that's why I was on uh, mute. But um, really nice to hear that there's a um, committee uh, for this type of stuff. Welcome. I thought you were going to say you were on board the Staten Island Ferry. No. <laughs> we look forward to working with you, and I guess we'll be in touch soon about how orientation and things are going to work. Cool. Uh, Thank you. Layla, I'd love to give you a chance to say hi before we get started on the joint agenda. I know you're here somewhere, except you, you're coming up as Suzanne Johnson mysteriously. Me unmute myself, but it'll be a first up. Uh, good evening, everyone. Hopefully, uh, you can all hear me. Um, this is Leila Longisico, and uh, I'm welcoming uh, everyone to the Joint uh, Parks and Landmarks uh, Committee. We uh, are excited to hear uh, about a presentation for uh, Central Park tonight. Thanks, Leila. So, without further ado, we will hand it over to Central Park Conservancy. I believe that the order we are going in, we will begin with the conservatory garden. Uh, although if I understand correctly, we are going to hear all four items in a row so that we get the, the big picture of what you are proposing. And then we'll go back into discussion over each one, one at a time. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, hi guys. Uh, I'm Gray Elam. I'm a planner and landscape architect at Central Park Conservancy and I'm here tonight with Bob Rumsey who is our studio director at the Conservancy. Everybody. Um, we are going to be, um, as Clayton mentioned, we're going to be really focusing tonight's uh, presentation on two projects in particular, um, the Conservatory Garden, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, and uh, the Dairy Access, or the, the Dairy Access Path, which will be um, 
facilitating access to the dairy facility. Uh, for those who are less familiar with that um, facility in the park, it's actually one of our more popular visitor centers and gift shops. Uh, and as the name suggests, it's actually uh, was originally created as a, a, a distribution point uh, for fresh milk for children. Um, so that's a, a fun fact. Um, we Both of these projects, uh, both the conservatory garden and the dairy access pack are really um, uh, on, require minor design changes uh, to bring back the original design elements, uh, which in both cases actually includes the historic paving patterns, uh, as well as uh, some improvements for uh, to create uh, accessibility. Um, we also, while we're here, wanted to just give you guys a heads up about two other projects that are moving forward. Uh, the uh, perimeter restoration work that will be going on from East 85th Street to East 90th Street, um, and the restoration of um, Bendheim Playground, which is located at East 102nd Street. Um, so we'll mention those two briefly at the end of the presentation, uh, just so you guys are up to speed on some other work that's going on in the park. Um, and then before handing this over to Bob, just wanted to quickly orient you here on this map. Uh, you can see that the dairy is located around 65th Street in Mid Park, um, and the conservatory garden work, which is where we're gonna start today, uh, the presentation tonight, is located between East 104th and East 106th Street, uh, right off of Fifth Avenue. So I'll hand it over to Bob. <laughs> okay, great. Can everybody hear me all right? Yep. Okay, great. Thank you for having us tonight. We appreciate it. Um, so I will start with the conservatory garden, which Grace said is here at 100, the entrance is between 104th and 105th Street. Uh, this is an aerial view of the garden today. Uh, the garden was built, completed, I should say, in 1937 in the Robert Moses era. Uh, other than some focused, really focused repairs that took place in the 1960s, the garden has not seen a complete restoration of its, uh, of its integral pieces. Uh, there was a horticultural horticultural restoration that began in the 1980s, which continues today. Um, I'll use this plan to give you a little bit of bearing. So the garden is comprised of three gardens. Uh, in the south, at about 104th Street, is the English Garden. In the central, center garden, sorry, as you that you enter off of uh, Fifth Avenue through the Vanderbilt Gate is the Italian Garden. And then to the north, is the French garden and each of these gardens has its own kind of display fountain. Uh, as I mentioned in the 1980s the restoration began of the horticulture which continues today. For those of you who have been at the garden you know what I'm talking about. It's really beautiful. Our focus will not, uh, we will not be focusing on the horticulture here. We'll be focusing primarily on the, the hardscape components and the structures of the garden. So I call in-kind restoration, meaning uh, we're not changing the design at all. That would include all the pavements and the curbs on the pathways in the garden, all the retaining walls, primarily brick, uh, the stairs in the garden, which are various materials, both bluestone, granite, et cetera, and the, uh, with the pergola in the garden, which is up here on the upper terrace of the Italian garden. Modifications to the garden um, include replacement of concrete pavement that was introduced at a later date in the garden, and I'll go into those details in a minute, and uh, some accessibility improvements to the French garden here. So the following series of photographs are uh, kind of indicative of what the current conditions are in the garden. The uh, bluestone, original bluestone paving, uh, is in disrepair and uh, the concrete curbs are in disrepair as well as the, the drainage infrastructure. The uh, perimeter concrete paths surrounding the garden, I'll show you those on a map in a moment, uh, are severely patched due to re utility repairs over the years. This, is, this material was introduced later in the garden's life and we'll be restoring it to bluestone. I'll talk about that in a minute. 
repairs to walls, steps. Uh, you, you can see kind of what's going on in the garden. We have settling walls here, crooked. This is not a crooked photograph. This is actually a crooked wall. Uh, we have granite steps in need of repointing. We have brick walls cracking in need of repair, bluestone copings, etc. cetera. The, uh, the pergola in the Italian garden, the steel pergola original, uh, is in need of a uh, structural kind of renovation and refinishing. Uh, we will be maintaining the original design. There'll be no changes to the design. It'll just be a, a, a you know a structural um, structural improvements as needed and refinishing. Going back to the aerial view, I'll talk about the paving in the garden. So inside the garden, you see this dark darker gray. Uh, though that uh, is existing bluestone today, and that will be replaced in kind with the same type of bluestone, same patterns, et cetera, same sizes. Um, the white areas on the outside are what I talked about earlier. These are uh, currently concrete paths uh, that were introduced in the 60s in the garden. And again, they'll be uh, restored to the original bluestone patterns. During our research, we discovered, we, we, did, we did not know this going into actually uh, into the restoration of the garden. We discovered through some photographs, uh, the parks department, that this outer perimeter was indeed originally bluestone. You can see, see that here down in the lower, lower left of this photograph. Um, and we discovered these drawings from the 60s uh, in which it discusses the replacement of that bluestone with concrete. And we simply think it was due to uh, the disrepairs. I mean, these photographs were taken in the 60s. You can see how poorly uh, broken up it is. We believe it was just taken out as a, a, a you know, a, a alternative cheaper method at that time. Okay, so the other intervention or change I should say in the garden can, is uh, focused in the French garden here. This garden consists of two levels. You enter this outer path through either, uh, there's three entrance, entrance points. Um, it's an upper level path which then, which is here, and it takes you down through a series of steps, four different locations down into the lower garden here, which is where the uh, Untermeyer fountain exists. So as part of the project, it's important that we create accessibility uh, where we can. And uh, given the symmetry of this garden, we also believed it was really important not to do just one stair in one location, but to provide an equal experience and an equal aesthetic throughout the entire garden. So we are going to be applying this uh, design change to all four locations. So the design change, uh, if you look at the if you look at the section on the upper uh, part of the page, you can see here the existing section cut through shows the upper level going down four stairs to the lower level, and it's flanked by these brick cheek walls that capture the stairs on both sides. Oops, excuse me. Um, our proposal would take the upper path and the lower path and connect them via a ramp. We Believe it or not, we have just kind of enough linear run to make an accessible, an ADA ramp at about 8% uh, from this upper path to the lower path. But it will require that we uh, add to the existing walls that are there so that we capture the ramp on both sides. So the existing wall will remain as you see here and it will be, uh, it will be extended toward the back, toward the upper path and the lower wall, the more discreet lower wall so we don't uh, kind of block the views of the, of the display gardens below will be uh, installed on the lower part. And then, of course, handrails on both sides of the ramp, which are a part of the ADA uh, accessibility requirements and code. And then, um, not necessarily to be seen, but a larger part of the project, uh, the, the garden has a uh, eight foot high or so fence surrounding the entire property. Um, and it will be restored completely. Uh, we have some significant erosion problems on the upper part of the garden. And so we'll, we will be replacing, we'll be setting the fence, the restored fence into kind of a lower uh, concrete wall to capture runoff from uphill and then direct it into uh, focused drainage structures. 
this really won't be seen. It'll be hidden by plants, but we did want to tell you of that change. So that's it for the conservatory garden. Moving on to the dairy, uh, as part the, the dairy as, as part of the uh, in kind restoration that's going to be happening, uh, we want to create access accessibility to the dairy. Um, it is our main visitor center in the park, so it's important that all users can can get there. Uh, currently, the path leading down from the closed East Drive here down to the dairy is not accessible by code. Um, and nor is the crosswalk leading across the drive that leads people to the north here. People approach this entrance from the south, from the north, and also from the east. This is a view looking down from the closed east drive down the path that is, as it exists today into the loggia. The loggia is this structure at, you know, at the front of the dairy. It's currently a 14 foot wide path. And then looking back up from the loggia toward the closed east drive where you see the parked cars in the background. Again, the path is coming down. It's a historic path. Uh, we don't believe it's ever really changed uh, from the original plans. And so we, it's important that we maintain it from an access perspective, but also from an aesthetic perspective and use perspective. So we will be maintaining that sort of 14 foot wide uh, path coming in. This plan uh, below in gray, you see the existing conditions and uh, I hope you can read this. We, uh, we have kind of an overlay in the dotted line of what the proposed plan is and we'll sh I'll show you the proposed plan in a minute. But we just wanted to sort of show you this comparison. So the current crosswalk comes across here and goes down the path. Um, we will be modifying these curbs to create a, a crossing here. So it aligns well with the new ramp structures going down and then here maintaining the path uh, going down. So the proposed, the proposed plan looks like this. So we'll, we have the, again, the path, we'll be adding this five foot wide accessibility ramp experience down to the, the loggia and then um, adding the crosswalk and kind of regrading this area. So this is completely uh, compliant. So I'll be, the next illustration is a section cut through this part of the, of the path and the ramp. Whoops. So again, looking from, as if you were standing, looking toward the dairy, uh, reconstructing this path, granite curb down to the lawn area, and then introducing this five foot wide accessible ramp. Because they are going at slightly different pitches, we have a, a nine, nine inch wide dark granite curb to separate the two. Uh, and then of course, steel, black steel handrails on both sides, which is uh, part of the accessibility requirement of a, uh, of a ramp. Beneath the loggia, we are going to be, we're, we're proposing a, a, a historic paving change. Uh, the existing conditions as they are here today are a combination of uh, the historic bluestone banding that still exists. We believe it's been replaced over the years, but it's in its current, uh, or in its original form. The hex block paving is a more modern intervention, which we intend to change back to brick. We have language, although we don't have the original plans that show that it was brick, we do have language in the 1870 annual report indicating that it was a brick and bluestone pavement. And so our intention is to remove the hex block, the uh, hex pavers, excuse me, and uh, introduce brick pavers in a herringbone pattern, a dark kind of a dark orange red brick, uh, a pattern that would have been common at that time and you know as a as a traditional pattern. So that is the uh, that's the dairy. The last two projects uh, we're not looking for a resolution on. We're just kind of wanted to give you a little bit of information on them. Uh, very briefly, this is Robert Bendheim Playground at, one, at East 100th Street along Fifth Avenue. It was a playground that was uh, done in the 1990s by the Conservancy, uh, meant to be or, or was a, a universal, universally accessible playground. The focus of our work is going to be the um, replacement of this piece of equipment. The current piece of equipment has, you can access via ramps on this end and on this end. And so wheelchair or disabled users can take the entire circuit across the, the structure. 
works beautifully. Um, unfortunately, you know, uh, the standards, or fortunately, I should say, the standards have changed over time. And uh, there's some compliance issues that we uh, are not really repairable. We actually have to kind of, we have to replace the entire piece. Uh, so we lo we're looking to put, replace it essentially the a very similar, if not the same footprint, with a very um, similar look, post and platform style. We will be getting rid of the roofs, so it'll be a little more discreet, and the color will probably be more of a, a grayish color to be a blend in a bit to the park. Uh, since we're doing the work, of course, we'll be um, replacing the safety service beneath it in kind, same color. Uh, the asphalt paving in the central area, the water feature and the sandbox will remain as they are. The swing area will remain as it is. Um, we will take the opportunity as we've done in so many of our other playgrounds to reduce the height of the fence. It is currently a six foot plus fence and we'll be taking that down in the same pattern, the same look to a, a four foot six uh, fence. It'll remain a, a black steel picket fence in the, in the same style. It'll just provide um, a visual, less of a, a barrier and a, a feeling of uh, connection between the park and the playground. And lastly, uh, the perimeter project between East 85th and 90th, uh, the perimeter as we refer to it is between the perimeter wall of the park and the street curb. And historically it has always has consisted of a, a nine foot path down the center with granite block on both sides in varying diamond patterns and benches along, uh, along the way. Uh, this is a photograph of work. So this is a continuation of work that we have already started in the park. Uh, this, this being uh, the work that we did between East 60th and 64th Street a few years ago. So the focus of the work is a replacement of the hex block pavers on the path the flush concrete curbs, again, all in kind. Where the existing uh, granite block exists, we will, we will reset it if necessary, but maintaining um, and restoring the, the patterns. But areas like this, which are actually bus stops, uh, currently are hex pavers. Um, the original granite block was replaced at some point to make the bus stops accessible. So we would like, we're going back to kind of the historic pattern of the, uh, the granite block, but using a granite block that is, uh, has an accessible surface. And then at the bench areas, we'll use that same technique, uh, create accessibility to the bench areas and provide companion seating at those benches as well. And that is the project. Those are all the projects. And I, I didn't talk about timeline on these. I will. I can. I, I can. I can do that now. It probably would be easier because I'm sure people have those questions. Um, yes, that'd be great. Let me just go. We'll start with the conservatory garden. Um, it's a ten million dollar dollar project. It's privately funded. The funding is secured for the project. Uh, we plan to start. We have planned to start construction in October. Um, it'll be about a two year project. The garden will be phased. The, should, the construction will be phased so that uh, at least for most of the time, the entire garden will not be shut down. There'll be always be pieces of it that are, uh, that are accessible. Uh, we'll try to work from garden to garden as much as possible. There is drainage infrastructure and a, a utility infrastructure that I didn't, I didn't mention that will require uh, some significant, uh, um, significant work. Um, the dairy, uh, so all of these are with a caveat, of course, uh, you know, not knowing what the schedule will bring. Um, these are our current plans. Uh, of course, we'll be flexible and have to react to uh, timing as need be, given the current situation. Uh, the dairy, uh, it, uh, the project is actually gone, uh, or it will be, um, the intention was for it to start this summer, actually late spring. Um, that is going to be pushed back, obviously. Um, but and the idea. I, was, just to jump in real quick, the so the the dairy facility itself was um, it's a it's a two part project. The dairy facility itself was about to, was uh, going to be first, and it was an in kind restoration of the facility, a true in kind restoration, um, which was soon to set. We were going to set a construction date shortly. 
And then this project, the accessibility project would be tagged on to the end. And then that's, that's the piece that we're talking about today. Right, thank you, Greg, for that clarification. So again, if the schedule had, if the existing schedule had remained, we would have looked for kind of a spring opening here um, that likely will be pushed back. Uh, the perimeter project, again, uh, we're looking to kind of start that work. Uh, it's going out to bid this summer, uh, looking to start it as soon as we can, um, as soon as the uh, construction constraints are, are um, let up. And uh, Bendheim Playground is similar schedule. And they're, they, sorry, the perimeter, let me jump back and forth here, I apologize. The perimeter is about a nine to 12 month project. Uh, we would, would do that project in phases. So only one block would be under construction at a time approximately. Uh, and Bendheim Playground would be no more than a six month construction window. So I think I've got everything. If you have any other questions, let me know. Thanks, Bob. And you mentioned the funding for the conservatory garden, yes. but could you update us on the funding for the other three? Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, the dairy is also private funding. So that is uh, secured funding. Uh, the perimeter project is city funding, but it, it has been, you know, it is secured. It's, it's money that we have been uh, um, issued. And Bendheim is also private funding and again, secured. Can I ask a question about that funding? Sure. Uh, Chris, yeah, actually go ahead. Okay. Um, are you able to share if that came with anything like naming rights uh, or any strings that the, the funders have attached to it? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no, no. Uh, no, there's no name, there's no changes in names out of any of these projects. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, great. So what we are going to do now, we are generally regard these first two items as, which are the, which we believe are going to be the voting items tonight as largely landmarks concerned since they are so much about materials. Uh, however, we will open the floor for both committees one at a time and hear any questions that we have about this. So what I'm gonna do now is corral the questions from the Parks and Public Spaces Committee those of you who are on both landmarks and parks, you can hold your landmarks related questions just for a couple of minutes. Uh, and I, and please use those of you who have not yet been on one of these calls, please use your raise hand feature in the participants pop up window in order to show me that you have a question right now, please only parks and public spaces committee members. Um, but I will begin with a question about uh, so we'll start with the conservancy garden. Sorry, we're going to do one by one for our discussion. So with the conservancy garden, I just had a question about the the timeline and the two years. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've noticed just organically there that the gates tend to be locked, not often, but somewhat inconsistently, and I can never quite figure out why it is that the conservancy garden is occasionally just closed. Mm. So that's something that I, I'm. It's not super relevant right now, but I am curious as to do you expect the total closure of the conservatory garden uh, throughout this two years as a result of the project above and beyond what you what you normally do? So uh, to speak to your first point, I, the garden is you know locked at night. Uh, it is closed at nighttime. If there are other occasions where you've seen it closed, it might have been for a special event or maintenance or something that was going on inside. But it's pretty regularly opened early morning and closes at dusk. Um, uh, then there is access off of Vander Vanderbilt Gate and then around to the kind of northwest corner. So the intention for the project is we're going to work in focused gardens uh, and keep, so for example, um, this is not settled yet, but we may start, for example, in the English garden to the south, work on that, and then uh, keep the other two gardens accessible during that time. Now, of course, there may be some overlap where we need to close down the garden for a few days or something. But generally speaking, we plan to keep a significant chunks of the garden, like, you know, either the English garden, the Italian garden, or the uh, the French garden open to the public. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, partially. Also, with the, the, the pergola, I know, is a super popular destination for yeah, weddings is. and photo shoots and uh, how do you, ex how do you imagine, you, when you referred to the restoration of that structure, it, yep. it, it looks like it's in pretty bad shape, but your language made it sound like it was kind of minor. How, uh, how long do you expect that area to be inaccessible? 
I would say it, it's not it's not insignificant the work on the pergola. It's in pretty rough shape. Uh, we will be probably taking first of all, kind of full disclosure here. We actually have to take the wisteria off of it to do the work. So we will be actually cutting it back. We're not removing it, but we'll be cutting it back significantly and letting it regrow. Part of the issue with the pergola is that the wisteria has actually gotten embedded in it and actually raked it apart and actually pulled the structure apart. It is it is that strong of a plant. Um, I would think that we'd probably be in that garden for maybe up to six months. Uh, it's it's a significant, it's not just the pergola, but it's the paving and it's the drainage and so forth in that area. It's, it's significant. So it will definitely uh, impact uh, access, but we also, you know, we need to make it safe. Uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it's been, it has been modified over the years to keep it safe, but we need to make it safe for the long term. So I would imagine, um, you know, I'm, I'm shooting off the hip here a little bit, but about I would imagine six months will be in that garden and the that portion of the Italian garden, that upper part. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Chris. Um, so my question was just about one specific slide that you had displayed earlier. Would you uh, like to go back to it? Um, yeah, that could be helpful. I am um, my screen, so let me go back to it. It's it's a very straightforward question, and that is, uh, you'd shown it as just an example of some of the deterioration that had taken place over time. In the conservatory um, garden you're referring to? In the to? conservatory garden, that's right. Okay. Um, and it, it displayed a, a very steep looking set of stairs. I assume that since the general tenor of this project is to make it more accessible, um, that there are accessible options as an alternative to these stairs, but since we're on the topic, I, I wanted to yeah. ask. No, no, it's a good point. Actually, I, I meant to actually address that. And let me go back to the plan and I will do so. Uh, so the set of stairs that we're looking at are right here, but actually this garden is completely accessible via these paths. So this entire garden, uh, except for the, the, the terrace, uh, which is, um, would be, would require an elevator to get up there. <laughs> There's really no way to get up there, but this lower part is completely accessible. Uh, these gardens, these gardens. So the only inaccessible part is going down these sets of stairs to this lower stepped garden. So we will, uh, yeah, where necessary, and it's really just that one part, we will be making it accessible. Okay, got it. Thanks. Mike. Yes, um, so I was wondering, this is a two year project. We're not sure when it's going to begin. And it's also going to be concurrent, as I recall with the work on the Harlem Mirror, just half a mile north. Um, I'm wondering how the two things are going to um, uh, get along with each other, if the Fifth Avenue is going to be affected or just how that north eastern side of the park is going to be affected. That's question number one. Number two is how do you get a playground named after you, like Mr. <laughs> Rumson? Um, to your first point, um, they, there may be overlap in these projects. There likely will be. The, act, the construction access for the Harlem Mirror will happen completely off of um, 110th Street, down that, that through the, uh, you know, the drive that goes up to Lasker. So the construction components won't inter interfere with each other. Uh, from a use perspective, sure, there will be uh, there will be there'll be downtimes in the park for both. Um, but we, you know, we continue to manage our construction projects well and continue to, uh, you know, kind of manage the use in the park. And we think that we, uh, you know, we'll do the same here. There, there are two significant projects that will bring great improvements to the north end of the park. Uh, as for the, your last question, um, I, I can't answer it. <laughs> it, and it no, I mean, the playgrounds are, uh, some of them are funded and a name is given to them and others aren't. Uh, there's very, there's varying histories to that, of which I am not really, uh, probably the one that could speak the best to it. I apologize. That's okay, thank you, Bob. So just a reminder, we're gonna keep our questions right now focused on the conservatory garden application. Uh, Parks and Public Spaces Committee members, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, while I'm waiting for hands, I just want to add the detail that when it comes to the Conservatory Garden Gate, 
Uh, the gate at Fifth Avenue and 106 is the one that seems to somewhat uh, consistently be closed during the day. It's the gate further up is open at the same time. So it's not as if it can't be, it's not as if the whole thing is shut down, but that gate is for some reason closed. The, uh, Clayton, I'm sorry, the one here, right? At, uh, at um, the off of this entrance, uh, am I sharing my, my plan? So oh, yeah, yeah. Right here? Yes, that's right. Yeah, that, that gate often remains closed because we limit access into the garden into one spot. Uh, you're right, that, that gate often does remain locked, um, but that does not mean the garden is closed. Um, we, we maintain access to this gate because that's where the public restrooms are. So that becomes kind of the main focus, the main entrance into the garden. But what exactly is the logic for that though? Uh, I understand that uh, it's just about, you know, directing people in into the public restrooms through that gate. Um, why that guard? I know it's sometimes it's open, sometimes it's closed. I'm not, you know, I, I can't speak to why that why that is. I could certainly find out and get back to you on that. Well, I mean, it's not it's not the most vital point, but it is something that I'm curious about. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, Todd. Uh, I applaud this, it looks great. I'm just wondering with regard to the garden project, can you speak to the issue for the $10 million of, again, assuming that the next time you get around to refurbishing this of durability of some of these repairs and you know back uh, uh, upgrades or the, how long could you expect them to last? Um, we're, we're planning for a lifetime, you know, for example, the bluestone uh, that's currently out there is mostly two inch thick bluestone. And uh, we know that certain areas of this garden have uh, loading requirements, vehicles come in there occasionally. And so in those areas, for example, we're using three to four inch bluestone, much thicker material. So we are building definitely for durability. Um, I didn't speak to kind of the infrastructure in the garden that uh, you know, is not aesthetic, but we will be kind of redo, redo, part of the construction of the garden is actually redoing this entire drainage trunk line that exists here. Um, most of the drainage in the garden is, uh, is 80 years old at this point. It needs to be redone. So as part of this work, we will be redoing drainage. Um, so we're looking to to not just, you know, it's not a surface treatment, it's an integral treatment and it's, it is, it's for the long term. So we hope to get another 80 to 100 years out of it uh, easily. That's great, because the reason I ask is because some of the other projects that were done in the 60s, 70s and 80s, it's, they weren't built for the ages, they cut corners like crazy. Yep, so we're not, we're not looking to do that. We wouldn't do it if we, um, you know, it wouldn't make sense to do it that way. Thank you, Todd. Okay. Barring any further questions from Parks Committee members, I will hand it over to Layla to take questions from Landmarks. Also, we will get to members of the public uh, eventually. Don't worry. Thank you, Clayton. Um, okay, so members of the uh, Landmarks Committee, uh, let's go uh, to questions about uh, the garden. Um, so questions that would have to do more with uh, materials, uh, historic contextuality, uh, that type of stuff that we uh, usually deal with. Do we have any questions? Uh, Barbara. Thank you. Um, I just wanted, you didn't mention the material of the railing in the, um, the French garden. I was wondering what that is going to be made out of and how will that look? Sure, um, it's, it will be a, a black powder coated steel um, and uh, it will have a kind of a sort of a, a round upper railing with a, a tube, like a tubular upper railing with a bar stock post. Relatively simple, discreet. We're not looking to add you know, ornament into the garden. We wanna keep it kind of quiet and let the garden speak for itself. So it, it is a standard railing that we have used in other areas of the park. Mm-hmm. And I'm just curious, so the um, the other entrance that's off the inside of the park, that's the ADA entrance to this, to the gardens? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Um, the entrance into the conservatory gardens um, that's off the park, the more western entrance? Uh, th this side? Yes. 
so that's the that's how that's the accessible entrance into the park because I don't think from Fifth Avenue there's steps that go down into it, right? Uh, you can come off 106th Street here, which is accessible, and these yeah. paths are all accessible around, correct? To here, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. that's what I thought. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, other question, Dave Ikalis. Um, yes, I was just wondering, you're lowering the depth of the basin and the Untermeyer Fountain. Oh, yes. Yeah, I mean, there are fish in there, aren't there? Uh, there are, but they will they will live in there. We're, we're lowering it, not from an aesthetic. It's a it's a code issue. Thank you for addressing that. I didn't I didn't bring that up. Um, you're allowed 18 inches of water in a public kind of fountain pool. So we're lowering it. Uh, again, it's a code. And the there are some fish in there. Uh, they get taken in and out on a seasonal basis. And so uh, they'll be well taken care of. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm not, I'm sorry. I'm not sure I totally understand. What exactly are you lowering? Uh, let me go to show you that. The Untermeyer Fountain here, which is uh, in the French garden, mm -hmm. we're simply, <laughs> we're keeping the, everything in place, the coping, the basin, the statue, and we're simply going to be uh, filling in the bottom of the pool uh, to make it eight, comply to the 18 inch health uh, code. Okay. There's no aesthetic change. Um, actually, there, there are some old concrete uh, plot, pot stands in there that are quite unattractive. And so we'll be cleaning that up and actually making it look a, a whole lot better, I think. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, next question, next question uh, Karen Pedrazzi. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, I appreciate the presentation and really admire and commend the accessibility that you guys are achieving. I have a question about the four or five risers that lead to the center, found, the center fountain. Sure. Um, were you able to study to see if you could alleviate the handrails by doing a more gradual slope of like a one to 20 ratio? And then just curious. And there's not enough linear, um, there's not enough linear room for that. I mean, so from the upper garden, one in, one in 20 is 5%, which is accessible, mm -hmm. but we don't have that linear run for that. So from the upper garden here to the lower garden, we can actually just make the eight, 8%, eight which is, uh, you know, the kind of the, um, the steepest that you can mm -hmm. make a, a ramp. Okay. So it's 8%, one, like, about one in 12. Yep, exactly. One in 12. The one in okay. 20 that you speak to is a 5%, which is, um, you know, but that's accessibility that doesn't require a handrail. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, members of the Landmarks Committee, do we have any other questions? Okay. Seeing none, um, I actually have a, a question about the wisteria. Sure. Um, is there any way to actually uh, detach the wisteria from the pergola um, without having to cut it? I know that wisteria is a, uh, a beast of a, of a plant and it, it's probably uh, quite mature, uh, but I was wondering if there was any way to, uh, to salvage some of it or more of it than what you seem to describe as, you know, cutting it. Yeah, so I would love to say there is because I've, we've looked at it in pretty in depth. And there, there, so if you, I mean, the only really close up I have in this presentation is here, but there's possibility that we could take some of these runners and maintain them without cutting them all the way back to the ground. When you get into areas like this where they're actually integrated into the column, there's there's just no there's absolutely no way we could detach those because uh, they're they're literally integrated around uh, the column. Um, there we will certainly look to see if we can maintain as much of it as possible. Uh, if there's some long runners, we'll cut them. You know, we'll keep them as long as we can and stake them um, up high and and try to maintain them and then lay them back. Uh, but it's it's just not possible when you actually get to, um, when you actually look at them, uh, they're completely integrated into the columns. And that, that just goes to, you know, maintenance over time. You know, there were, there were years where the conservancy wasn't really looked after and the, the wisteria was allowed to just do its own thing. And 
the staff there now maintains it as, as well as it can, but those, those, uh, those mistakes were allowed to kind of take over for too many years. And, uh, you know, the, the good news about taking it back is that we'll be able to actually retrain it the way it should be maintained without actually getting integral in, into the columns and, and destroying them. I mean, you could look at, they could look at this photo and actually just like that is a result of the, the wisteria just breaking that apart. Um, it's, kind uh, of it's kind of incredible. Yeah, yeah. Can you actually explain to us or uh, you know, uh, enlighten us on uh, who is going to assist you? Like, do you have a, uh, an horticulturist orti uh, assisting you on? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the horticultural crew in, in the conservatory, in the conservancy garden, that conservatory garden that we rely on heavily, we collaborate with, we'll be collab collaborating with on this project. And uh, if, if they don't do the work directly, and a contractor does it, they'll certainly be overseeing it. And uh, it's, it'll be a very focused uh, intervention uh, with their professional insight. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, members of the Landmarks Committee, any more questions? Yeah, I see one more question. Uh, Suzanne Johnson. Um, hi, uh, this is very exciting. Good job, you guys. Um, okay. I just had a question about, I know this, there's a, a big um, amount of money going into the, the park for these projects, which is terrific. And um, kudos to the park, that's exciting. Is there any signage to acknowledge um, people who have, may have donated on behalf of this to underwrite this or, or not? I, I may have missed that. So I've the, been uh, this is actually a group call. that's doing this. It's, it's actually the women's committee that's actually do, providing the money for this. Um, so right. So they actually have plaques and so forth in the garden already, and and will be. They may be adding some signage. At the, I, I'm not, I'm not aware of it right now. If they, if they are. Okay. Um, the less, the better, I guess. <laughs> yeah. No. We. Yeah. We. We. We're very discreet about the signage. I don't think we'll be adding. You know, any. If if we do, it would be incredibly discreet. I'll just, piggy, I'll just piggyback on that quickly to, to ask that when you have any details about that, could you please let us know yeah, as sure. soon as you're aware of such a thing? Absolutely. Thanks. Good job. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions on, um, on this uh, proposal? Okay, so seeing none, um, maybe we're going to move uh, to the uh, to the dairy. Um, I will hand it back to uh, Clayton so that members of the Parks Committee can uh, shoot their questions first. Sure. Um, Parks Committee members, do you have any questions about the dairy project? Uh, while I'm waiting to see, I, I wanted to make sure I understood correctly the initial part of the project, which I believe, Gray, you meant was the interior of the building, in-kind restoration of the interior. That's a project that I didn't quite catch that. Is, is, is meant, was meant to happen imminently and now you don't know, but it's going to happen first? Is that what you said? Yeah, so it's the, the first phase of the of this project is, is the facility itself. And then the landscape is this, the site work is the second phase. Um, and the construction of the dairy, uh, the, the start date what hadn't been set, but we were hoping to begin it very soon. And obviously that's been delayed because of what's going on. Um, but as soon as we're able to pick back up on the work, that's we'd like to begin with that facility itself. Okay. Does that and help explain it? Well, yeah, even though we don't really have details about that portion of the project, what, what is the anticipated impact for accessibility of the public to the building? You know, what's the timeline for that, that part of it? Um, you mean how long, how long will the facility itself be closed? Yes. Right, so we're expecting that the project, the whole project is around a, Bob, correct me, a two year project, is that right? No, no, no? actually, uh, no, the dairy itself, uh, so if schedules had played out the way they were supposed to, we would actually have been started the work already and it was to be done next spring. Um, and along with uh, the accessibility path and so forth. Um, it's an in-kind work. I, um, 
Yeah, I mean, does that did that did answer your question? I mean, that that would that was the proposed time frame. So there would be about a nine month window of. Uh, uh, we were the... going to offset the programming um, by moving some of it into temporary containers and things of that nature that we were putting at the chess and checkers. So that the programming elements would still be in place while the facility was being restored. Thank you. I see. Yes. It doesn't look like there are uh, questions from my committee, Layla. Okay, all right, so let's go to uh, questions from members of the, uh, the Landmarks Committee on uh, the dairy. Do we have any questions? Yes, Barbara. Um, so if I understand it correctly, you're shifting the, um, the path just a little bit to the south Let to make room that. for the, um, yeah. <clears throat> You're shifting it just a little bit to the south to make room, a little more room for the, the ramp. Correct. We have some uh, mature tree here uh, that we're trying to stay away from and so uh, and, and, and not impact that landscape. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, we're shifting it just, I think it's about two to three feet here. Um, and then as you see, it comes back. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, the, the crosswalk wasn't accessible for in terms of the slope or um it's too steep. Okay. It like one to twenty. It's it doesn't it's more than five percent. Mm -hmm. So at that okay. point you have to go to a, a ramp situation. Mm -hmm. And uh laying a ramp into there requires, you know, landings and so forth. And so it, you couldn't you couldn't have just put a ramp on top of that path. Uh you would have had to regrade the entire path. So the idea is to separate these two so that this, this will have three la uh, two landings, excuse me, one here, one here, and then of course upper and lower. Um, so it goes down, it flattens out, it goes down, it flattens out, it goes down. You could not have done that if you put that on this path. It would have been a different grading exercise and it would have had a, a major implication to that path. Mm, okay, thank you. Yeah, it, it's... Yeah, I think I think hopefully I explained that well enough. Importantly, what we're doing, a big driver behind the design is to maintain the historic alignment of the path to the the um, loggia, which is in one of the earlier yeah. um, photographs. And be because this is a visitor center, we have a lot of vehicles that have to get down in here and make deliveries and so forth. And so uh, if we, you know, bringing that ramp over here, we 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 couldn't have narrowed it. We would have we would have uh, created issues with accessibility, vehicular accessibility. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, uh, Suzanne. Um, I think it was just answered. I raised my hand at the same time, so I think it all came out um, from the timing standpoint. But um, so I understand. I spend so much time in this area. I love this area. I'm here all the time with my dog. Um, so I'm thrilled that you are lowering this access because it's such a quagmire getting into this area. So I think cleaning up that crosswalk will be really helpful. So that's very exciting to, to hear. Um, I guess the you explained the 14 feet, how you can't use that access. You have to add an additional five and the sloping and so forth. I was going to ask about the consolidation of that so that you weren't going to um, impact into the um, landscaping and so forth. Um, as much green space as possible, but I'm sure you've taken that into consideration. And yeah. are you adding more landscaping then in order to yeah. not make it look like 20 feet of... Yeah, thick? we will be certainly restoring, you know, we're, we're actually going to be, do, as much as it looks like we're doing here, it's only three to four feet. And so we'll be doing oh. restoring that landscape. And then, um, you know, th this is currently lawn right now. So we're really maintaining right. it as it is. Um, there's some plantings here that we intend on maintaining or replacing if they do get uh, damaged during construction of the building. But um, all in all, uh, yeah, it's, the idea is that it will it'll be relatively quiet. Good, because I, I, first of all, we take our Christmas picture there when it snows, just so you know. But the, um, it's important that you know that, but the, um, the green part, there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of beautiful bushes and so sure. forth. Are you replacing that fence then in the green, in that green part there with, you know, the rocks and then you go down and there's this. Back here? No, I'm sorry. Um, 
well, not good directionally, but where um, on the lower fence that that um, um, surrounds the lawn with, you know, surrounds the lawn area. Like, uh, well, the range, do fencing? the range fence you're referring to? Yeah. yeah. Um, the range fence is a more of an operational thing uh, that that uh, that we use to manage use of lawns and try to uh, uh, keep them in, in decent shape. So that's that probably likely will uh, will stay. It's you know it's more of a management tool. Okay. That's you know you see that throughout the park, uh, the range fence on the paths to kind of focus uh, uh, entry points into open areas. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions by members of the uh, Landmarks uh, Committee? Okay, seeing none, I have a couple of questions. Um, it looks like you are uh, doing some uh, changes to the um, to the curbs uh, to create this uh, crosswalk yep. um, on the uh, East Drive. Will that have uh, any impact on the um, the horse carriages? Like, are you changing the uh, the width uh, in any way, uh, or uh, widening it in a way that? Uh, may uh, become, you know, impactful to the uh, to the horses. Uh, actually, no, none whatsoever. The the horse lane is here. That width will main, remain the same. All we're simply doing is changing the the openings where the where the where the crosswalk happens from this location to here. So we're adding granite cobble and curbs here, adding them here removing them and then adding you know, adding them here. So we're just really changing that. The horizontal, uh, actually the dimensions across these paths are not changing at all. We're actually, uh, in order to make this path, we, have to, we actually have to, we have to lose a couple of cars here to actually make this path come down and connect across. But that's, uh, that's, but, but you are eliminating um, this open section um, Here. that uh, currently exists. Yeah, exactly this. Uh, is that being used uh, in any functional way by any users of the park, whether it is the, uh, the horse carriages no. or others? No, it's not. The, the, and, and this would replace it in kind, you know, this would, whatever function that was serving, this could certainly, could certainly happen here. For example, so vehicles might park, come in here and come out across there so they can get back onto the drive. The horses uh, are just strictly traveling through this area. They don't turn around here at all. They're, they, they, they don't make a U-turn. They don't use this portion no. to make a U-turn. Correct. No, they're designated to the section on the, the southern end. Um, it's just, it's just, it's literally just shifting the, the curbs. Okay. Maintaining the, an yeah. adequate width, an adequate opening. So those, whatever, you know, any maintenance vehicles that have to get into there can do so. But those would be the only thing that would, other than pedestrians, of course, that would be uh, okay. crossing over. Okay, all right, thank you. The the other question, if you go back to the uh, to the previous uh, slide that you had with the dotted line, mm -hmm. um, it shows those little uh, notches um, to the lines. Yep. Yeah, uh, if you can uh, explain to us what those represent. Sure. Uh, there's an existing. These are trash bins. We're just removing. We're just locate relocating the trash bins that exist there today. Okay. And then uh, there's actually a wayfinding sign that occurs here now, and we're actually, it shows up here in the plan. So trash cans are going here, Love and it. this is the standard parks wayfinding sign that is, okay. we're just- And, and on, on the other side to the, uh, yeah, yeah, yes. those. So there are currently bikes that are parked down here, bike rack, we're actually moving them up here because uh, it just doesn't function very well. And there isn't, you know, the ramp needs that space. So we're actually moving them up here um, to that that location. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, and uh, the other uh, the, uh, the ADA ramp itself mm -hmm. will have a similar design to the uh, the design of the um, conservatory. Uh, yeah. Other than it, it, it's it'll be asphalt rather than bluestone, uh, but it'll have a similar that similar railing detail. Uh, okay. The, um, about you know 30, 34 inches high, the railing, 36 inches high, and of that same black um, material that I just steel material that I described earlier. Okay. 
Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, all right, members of the uh, Landmarks Committee, any other questions for the applicant? Okay, seeing none, I will uh, pass back to uh, Clayton. Clayton, you're on mute. God, rookie mistake, ridiculous. <laughs> Uh, I think we should just go ahead and do questions for the other items, even though they may not be uh, voting items to simplify this process. So with the playground, would you mind just pulling up the slide of the playground, please? So I just have a couple of questions. And in the meantime, any Parks Committee members who have questions, please raise your hand. This seems to be somewhat out of the scope, unless I'm mistaken, of your your playground, what's it called? Your master plan for playgrounds over the last several plan years. Sorry? Plan for play. Plan for play, yes, which is a, a just a total success. And we have applauded every step of that extremely comprehensive process. But this feels almost, am I wrong? This feels a little bit like an add-on or an afterthought or something. Um, this playground is actually, uh, is actually, it's a successful playground and it was done in the late 90s. Um, and, um, you know, rich, frankly, we were originally going to try to just restore the, keep this piece in place and make a few minor, minor modifications to it. And as we got into it, real, we realized we couldn't, um, we actually had to replace the entire piece. So to that, to that respect, you're right. It's not a complete redesign, which is the reason that we, uh, didn't bring it to you in that regard. It's really just an in-kind, uh, replacement. There have been some playgrounds like that, um, it's a successful playground generally, uh, and it, it's small. Um, you know, we identified as we did our plan for play, we identified playgrounds that needed more intervention and, and those that didn't. And this was one that didn't require a significant amount of intervention. Understood, it's more of the Robert Moses playgrounds. Yeah, exactly, yes. Right. I'm remembering now. Okay, and then okay. just to follow up on that, you, you, you touched on this and I hear the part about that central, the sand pit. But can you explain what exactly of the rest of this equipment, what is being replaced and what is just being? Okay, so all of this is stain. This is all, this all remains as is. This is a water feature, which is currently not working, but we're actually gonna reactivate it. Uh, the sand box will stay the same. Uh, these are sand trays here, those will remain. Um, the paving is asphalt with a brick inlay and we'll be, I don't know if you can see the brick inlay, but we're going to be replacing that in kind. Um, this equipment, the, the, this, the swings stay as they are. They're completely compliant. Um, and then as far as this piece of equipment, the footprint will be very similar. You'll have, you'll have a ramp on both sides with a kind of circuitous uh, piece. It's just that, again, there's some, uh, there's some very kind of fine-tuned compliance issues on this that don't allow, don't meet today's requirements for kind of wheelchair turnarounds, uh, handrail um, requirements, et cetera. You'll be making modifications to that piece, but you're not replacing it. No, we are, we're taking this, please. The original intent was to, to, re, to do modifications to it. And as we studied that, it, we, real, it, we soon realized that the cost to do so was going to be equivalent, if not more than putting a new piece of equipment in, believe it or not. I see. Uh, it was that significant of a change. So this will be a, a new piece of equipment. Will look very much the same. We call it kind of a post and platform style. Uh, ramps on both sides. Um, kind of similar to what what you have in the um, playground. Oh, geez, what's the cross street nearby? Um, By the mirror, I think. So the 108th Street playground. Yeah. The little two to five. Yeah, actually, it's a uh, very similar equipment to that. Yes. Yes. Okay. Actually, the same, the same manufacturer, correct. All right, great. Um, okay, questions from the Parks Committee? Do I have any questions? Bueller, Bueller. Does not look like I have questions, Layla. Okay, members of the uh, Landmarks Committee, any questions? Okay, looks like none. Okay, then the perimeter path. Do we have questions from the Parks Committee? Going, going. Oh, we do, Dave. 
Yes, hi. Uh, I, this may be a little off the key here. Is there any plan to move to Central Park South to do something similar to this perimeter plan that you're doing here? Because Central Park South needs a little bit of work. I've noticed there's like six or seven empty tree plots there. I'm wondering if there's any yeah. plan. I, I would say eventually there is. Uh, it's not our current focus. We'll be focusing uh, from 80, 85th, I'm sorry, all the way up to 110th Street on the east side. Um, as, at some point, the Central Park South, I'm sure, will be done. Uh, it, I, it, I can't speak to that funding when that would happen, but uh, certainly is on our radar um, and we're aware of that situation. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the committee? All right, Layla. Okay, members of the Landmarks Committee, any questions? Okay, uh, seeing none, I think that concludes our question uh, period. Great, I think at this point, I'd like to see if there's any questions from members of the public on any of these items. If so, please raise your hand in the participants window. Seeing none, I think we can open a business session. Thank you very much, Gray and Bob, for all the information. Thank you for your question. Uh, Layla, I, I'm not sure if we should just, I think we can probably just open the floor for everyone. I'm not sure if we need to segment this conversation. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Great, so we will just take show of hands for uh, comments about the conservatory garden. I, I would say that um, it, you know, it, it looks like it's it's not going to be one of those uh, controversial uh, items. So, uh, for the sake of uh, making this uh, efficient, and given that we have another uh, stri strictly landmarks uh, agenda item, um, if uh, what you feel about it, it has already been voiced, uh, you know, just say so, or uh, you know, save the comment altogether. Uh, you know, just trying to make it uh, to make it efficient. With that being said, uh, let's go into comment period. Great, thank you, Leila. Everyone can raise your hand if you have something to share. I will just begin. I think that it is a very worthy project, and I, I admire the the rigor that the conservancy takes with their regard to in kind materials. I I don't love the timeline and how. Uh, extreme the impact on the use of the space sounds like it might be, but I know that they are doing their best to rotate which parts of the garden are closed at what time. I think from our committee's standpoint, that would probably be the greatest factor of our concern is just obviously public use and enjoyment of the space. And we know that's important to you too, uh, but that's something that we would we would be keeping a careful eye on. Yeah, and you know, I, I would jump in and uh, make a comment on the uh, the landmark uh, aspect of it. Um, I think that the uh, Central Park Conservancy takes really extreme care and goes into extreme length in researching uh, the uh, the history, researching materials. Uh, you know, they, they really do their homework. Uh, they take beautiful care of, uh, of the park, uh, not only, you know, in terms of making sure it is enjoyable, but also, you know, making sure that it is uh, historically appropriate, uh, contextual. And uh, I find that all the, uh, the modifications that they're proposing are done with uh, great care and great taste. It's been uh, researched, those are necessary, you know, bringing accessibility is very important um, and it is done uh, in a very uh, elegant uh, and, uh, and tasteful uh, manner. So I really applaud the, uh, the work that is proposed. Thank you. Uh, questions from anyone or comments? Yes. Uh, one thing that I will also add is as we move toward uh, thinking about a resolution for this item, the issue of naming rights, which was brought up and not just naming rights, but also a plaque uh, or plaques. I think it would be important to us to have in, in writing in the resolution that any information that comes available about that, we would want to know um, in advance just so that we could vet the, the degree. We know you're very cautious and careful about that, but we'd like to be informed. And Todd. Uh, 
unmute yourself, Todd. Okay, uh, I, I agree with what Layla said. It, it's it's amazing to me that the Central Park, Park Conservancy continues to make these presentations that show such care for the historical aspect of what's happening. And they obviously can come up with the money to do it. The only thing I wonder about, maybe some of the other people here in their experience, for example, there's no comment on any of this from the general public. Like I can remember seeing articles in the New York Times about issues uh, with the various playgrounds and the selection of uh, equipment there, right? You know, this dates back to the 90s. Is it really true that, you know, they say it's a successful, uh, it's a successful playground. Does anybody know about any issues with that selection of playground? I mean, is it in fact the case that everybody loves that selection of equipment and that there's nothing that can be done to improve it, you know, given, uh, you know, the experience with, the different types of equipment over the years. Thank you, Todd. Uh, I mean, I will. I will just respond with with their explanation about the equipment that they are replacing. Is equipment uh, the 108th Street playground was the one that they cited because that was the one that that came to mind. The similar type of equipment that's going to be replaced, and that is definitely newer, cleaner, more streamlined, and obviously more accessible equipment. So I, I certainly don't know about any particular objections to the existing equipment, um, but such as it is, I have seen and have familiarity with what it, what's going to replace it. And it's certainly an improvement. And to the point about the larger playground project that they've undergone over the last decade, the, the playgrounds that were neglected and that were devised and built in the thirties were really woefully it, it, it's kind of night and day compared to the state of this playground now. Um, I mean, that for my part, if anyone else has anything to add. The board office has not received any complaints recently about any kind of equipment or playgrounds. Todd, any further thoughts on that? Nope, oh, there's nothing in the record. I, I know that I saw an article at one point where a lot of the younger mothers and younger families had some sanitation questions about those big sandboxes, right? So you know, nobody's complaining about it, but I remember that stuck in my mind from when I saw that. Uh, you know, the issue of maintenance and safety, I guess, with the general improvement of the maintenance of the parks and the playgrounds, the parents just are not as concerned about that aspect of it. So, you know, they're keeping that big sandbox there. Thanks, Todd. Other comments? Vicki has her hand raised. Oh, Vicki. Oh, unmute yourself. Okay, okay there it is. I'm just curious if we have any um, comments or playback from any of the other boards. Luke, do we know about any of the record from the other boards? Gray might be able to speak. Gray and Bob yeah. might be able to speak to that. Yeah, I'd be curious right who else has gotten this presentation and if there were any comments, uh, concerns, questions. Uh, I think. I, oh. Go ahead, Gray. Yeah, so this is actually the, we've been to uh, five other community boards. We've been to community board, um, community boards seven, eight, nine, 10, and 11, and now you guys. Uh, we've received uh, unanimous support at every single committee. Um, we were originally trying to come to community boards in March, and obviously schedules were pushed back because um, of, uh, of the crisis. Uh, so we are still, Kind of we're getting full board resolutions and dribs and drabs at this point um but we've got about half of them uh, half the full board resolutions in. and at every committee we've had unanimous approval and their letters of support or resolutions have already gone out and they're they're, they're public now correct about half of them have been completely finalized gone through full board the other half are pending and will be coming through or are still 
a number of community boards have their full boards this week. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other comments? We kind of have moved into, I feel like we're having a general discussion about all four items at this point. So anything goes. Um, if there are comments about any of the items, please make yourself known. And otherwise I believe we can move toward hearing motions. All right, it looks like we can wrap up. Approve. Motion to approve. Okay, I guess we're second. bundling these. I'll second that. All right, we will bundle these two items. Let's. Uh, I would. I would add that it, it's a motion to approve uh, with a request for um, clarification on uh, any signage, naming rights, if any, um, and uh, th that type of uh, issue that we just discussed. Agreed. All right, let's do this one committee at a time. Craig, if you could do the vote tally for Parks, please. Yes, sir. Uh, Clayton. Yes. Craig, yes. David. Yes. Miriam. Yes. Chris. Yes. Aaron. Yes. John. Yes. Will. Yes. Uh, Mike. Yes. Kim. Yes. Todd. Todd, right, please unmute yourself. Craig, it's Will. You called me, but I was on mute at the time. It's a yes for me. Okay. Todd? Yes. Thank you. Barbara? Yes. Daniel? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Motion passes. All right, thank you. And now we're going to take the, uh, the vote for uh, landmarks. Uh, members who are on both committees, you get the privilege of voting twice. Um, so uh, let's start with uh, Dave. Yes. Uh, Buzz. Yes. Uh, James. Yes. Sarah. Yes. Laura. I don't know if we have Laura on the call. Uh, John. Harris? Yes. Uh, Nick? Nick Germer? Okay, Nick doesn't seem to be on the uh, meeting. Suzanne? Yes. Uh, Mike? Yes. Mike? That's yes. That's yes. Thank you. Renee? Yes. What? Sam? Yes. Uh, Lucas? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Richard. Uh, Richard is uh, not in attendance. Uh, Chuck. Yes. Thank you. Janet. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Karen. Karen. Uh, Barbara. Yes. And Tony. Yes. I just want to make sure, uh, Laura, are you uh, among She's the uh, panelists? Doesn't seem to be. And Karen? Karen's here. She's still on mute. I think it's her headset. I'm a yes. Thank oh. you. And Renee? I thought it was right before roll call, so I don't know if I'm allowed to vote. I mean, I-, I Yes, I you're, allowed, you're allowed to vote. I, yes, because I already did all the pre-work and I got here right at the... Yep, that's, that's yeah. good. Okay. okay, so, and Layla, I'm a yes, so uh, unanimous, uh, um, unanimous, unanimous. Whoa, that was intense. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I would just like to close the parks version of portion of the meeting by welcoming again our new board members, Noah, Joseph, and Jamie. And if you have any questions about tonight's proceeding, please note them. And we look forward to being in touch and answering your questions and working with you soon. So I will bid adieu to the Parks Committee. If you could please leave the room in a quiet and timely manner so the Landmarks Committee can continue its work. No side conversation, please. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Clayton. 
Uh, thank you very much to uh, members of the, uh, the Parks Committee. By all means, if you want to uh, stay with us, please do. Uh, we have uh, an exciting uh, item to review. Um, so welcome to our members of the, uh, the Landmarks Committee. This is uh, the Landmarks Committee meeting of Community Board 5. My name is Leila Logiziko. A few words on uh, how the meeting is going to proceed. Uh, so we have one item tonight for uh, review and action. Um, the applicant is going to give us a uh, full and uh, uninterrupted uh, presentation. After this presentation concludes, members of the committee will have an opportunity to ask questions. After this question period, we will move to uh, questions and comments by members of the public, if any. Um, once this uh, question comment period uh, concludes by uh, members of the public, we will move to business session. During business session, only uh, members of the committee are allowed to speak and we will uh, discuss the matter, we will make comments, and then we will make a motion. Uh, this motion will be uh, either to approve, approve the condition, uh, recommend denial unless the modifications are made, uh, or full denial. Uh, this motion will be forwarded to uh, the full board uh, that meets on uh, Thursday, the... Um, 14th, I believe. Um, uh, so uh, Thursday, May uh, 14th, and uh, the uh, vote of the full board becomes the official position of uh, Community Board 5. Um, this recommendation is then forwarded to the Landmarks Preservation Commission uh, and informs their uh, decision. So uh, tonight we are actually looking at uh, a at 222 Central Park South. Um, this uh, application was actually assigned to uh, Suzanne Johnson for uh, due diligence. Uh, Suzanne, if you want to unmute yourself and give us a very, very brief uh, overview, just give us the address, the cross street and uh, the scope of work, and then we will turn it to the applicant for their full presentation. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. So this application is for a proposed uh, window replacement and the location is 222 Central Park South. It's for apartment number four, which is on the north facade facing the street. Um, this building is also known as the Gainsborough Studios, which is a rare surviving example of an artist cooperative housing unit. And the applicant is loop, list, looking to uh, replace the steel windows with new materials uh, to match existing. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Um, so I think we have the applicant here with us. Um, I think Sarah is going to uh, give the, uh, the the presentation. Sarah, are you with us? I am. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Welcome. Uh, so you are the representative for uh, the applicant uh, for 222 Central Park South. And uh, the floor is all yours if you want to tell us what this. Yes. Thank you, and thank you all. Um, I'm uh, I'm pleased to be here. Pleased to be a part of this uh, presentation. Um, as uh, Suzanne Johnson mentioned, uh, the Gainsborough Studios is an interesting building on um, Central Park South, designed uh, in 1907 and built in 1908 uh, as a cooperative for specifically for artists and the uh, the design of the facade uh, celebrates uh, sort of inviting artists to it kind of it's got a, a sculpture honoring Thomas Gainsborough a sculptor and an artist um, it's a it's a it's gone through many iterations as as most New York City buildings have and right now the the facade I can see is I this is I'm new to this building so since I've been involved with this this application developing the materials for this application the actual facade is inaccessible since it's got a it's had a uh, uh, a scaffolding covering it for for quite some time for several months reading up on some history of the building I know that that there have been several phases of renovation specifically in the 1980s where uh, the original lobbies were uh, restored to, uh, based on drawings to their original, the, the, the lobbies were restored to their original format. So I would say that um, 
it's unknown to me how much of the historic building remains. And I think that there are some uh, open questions um, that I've gone back and forth with uh, the people at the Landmarks Preservation Commission on what the original windows were and therefore how much what we want to restore them to. But um, I will share with you my uh, my photo presentation first. When I find this on this uh, Zoom meeting, I will uh, be glad to share a picture. This is this is the building about 1910, and the um, apartment that we're talking about is here. It's the fourth apartment. The these front these front apartments are two store or duplex studios. So even though there are 15 floor stories, uh, the front facing apartments, and those were obviously the more, the preferable studios getting the Northern light. Um, this is the building in plan. It faces, it's very close to uh, Columbus Circle. Uh, I'm showing you a historic photo that that with a, an outline around the windows in question. Now this presentation, the, 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 the uh, Landmarks Preservation Commission has accepted the proposed proposed new windows for, for most of the most of the uh, application as thus submitted. The two windows in question are these two end windows on the upper level. This whole this this second level structure are steel windows. They are nine narrow panels with fixed windows between them. And even at a close up picture here, it's hard to say what these end windows were, whether they were casement windows, which would appear flat or double hung windows, which would appear uh, one pane would be in front of the other. So this remain, this is, this question has been in front of Landmarks Preservation Commission for several months now, as both myself and the preservationists looking at it, tried to figure out what these windows were. I'm going to show another, uh, uh, I'm going to share another picture for you. Well, let me just go through. Here's the, here's the facade at some point at an unknown time. This gives you a, um, a um, let me just, uh, control seven. Gives you a slightly better picture of what it was like more recently, but I can, you can see from different photos that the, that the windows have been modified. Double hungs have been replaced with single panels, et cetera, throughout. So hard to say what things were originally. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit, getting used to this system um, of presentation. I'll, uh, I'm trying to stop share, share screen. Uh, this picture is something that the preservation has sent to me to show me that the two end windows at an earlier time seem to have been double hung. So that is what leads us to this, to this hearing now is to find out it is to the, the application here is to see if we can get the proposed new window to be re, instead of replacing them with double hung, which is physically very difficult, impossible with steel windows to replace them with casement windows. This is, these are some pictures of the windows inside and out right now. The, you can see the, the tarp from the scaffolding. Uh, trying to enter full screen. Uh, these, this is the lower window. Now that's a wood casement window. Uh, and we're the, that has been approved by Landmarks to replace that with, the, with, with, a, with a wood casement window. And these are some of the details of those transoms, uh, muntins of the upper windows. Now going back to 
the historic photos. The uh, this is the the application is to replace these with what will look very similar to what's there now. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just get, sort of getting used to this sort of method, but um, I'll, I'll show you the drawings next. Uh, ba -ba. Okay, here we are. This is showing you what the existing windows look like. And these are the two windows that are in front of you now for approval. They look, that's the existing. So your, your screen actually shows uh, the uh, designation report. Ah, okay, sorry. Thank you for pointing this out to me. Uh, can I? Hang on. Oh, I see it. Sorry. Okay. This is the this is the lower level casement window, and this is the upper level set of steel windows. And the windows that we're talking about are these two end windows. These are these are the windows in front of you now for review and approval. This is what they look like existing, and this is how they compare. This is the existing on the left and the proposed on the right. And this is the, these are the dimensions to establish the uh, area of glass that will be maintained. The uh, Landmarks has approved the general profile of each of the proposed window versus the existing window. And the, uh, these are showing side by side comparisons of detail sections of the, the window that's in place now and the proposed window. And this shows you what the new window would look like. Um, it, in, instead of double hungs on these side, they would be casements. They re retain the horizontal sash to maintain the physical appearance of the original window. And that is the presentation um, in terms of where the questions are of what uh, of what is in front of you, it's basically the function of the window that landmarks cannot approve at staff level. Okay, thank you. Th does that conclude your yes presentation? Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so for uh, members of the committee, I just want to make sure that you understand uh, what is in front of us. Uh, so basically, because um, those two uh, side windows are, uh, are uh, double hung windows, meaning, you know, those windows if, that you can uh, lift up or pull down to open. Um, and the applicant is proposing to replace those with casement windows. A casement window is a window that pivots on a outside um, like exterior axis, like a vertical axis. So you basically pull it to uh, open and push it back to, uh, to close it. Um, so because of this change, it has to go through this particular review process. So what we need to determine is um, whether this modification in all its uh, aspects, uh, not only the functionality, but also the appearance, the, uh, the materials, the reduction or, uh, or increase in the amount of glazing, all these aspects are uh, what we have to look at in order to determine if uh, we feel comfortable with this proposal uh, or not. Um, so uh, that being said, let's go to uh, questions by uh, members of the committee on uh, this proposal. So please use your uh, raise hand function in uh, the uh, participants uh, little window. Okay, so uh, let's start with a question from Tony. Hey there, thanks, Layla. Um, Sarah, looking at the outside of the building on uh, Google Street View, 
I noticed it looked like several apartments have already at some point over time, maybe the last 20 plus years, have uh, replaced some of their windows, maybe some of them having faux mullions. I don't know how else to describe it. Does the building have a master plan at all for window replacement? No, it doesn't. And that's what part of uh, part of this hearing has led the uh, Landmarks Preservation is Preservation Commission to ask uh, to, to push this towards creating a master plan. Okay, There's, do you happen to know if, if the co-op would be receptive to that? I don't know at this time. The question has been put out there to them. I have not heard a yes or no back. It's happened in a very short period of time. It was just a few weeks ago when I heard from uh, Landmark's final decision was, yes, they generally are in approval of the overall design and meeting the profiles, meeting the glass area, meeting the sight lines of the historic windows. Um, but that this last, this one part needed to have um, um, approval. They would like it to go towards a, um, uh, a master plan. I have not gotten a, an answer back from the, uh, from the, from the board, the, the people, the board of the building as of yet. I hope okay. to. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Buzz. Buzz. Yeah, Mike, yes, I got it. My, my question is, uh, it wasn't clear to me if, if they are double hung windows now and they open, what is the objection to replacing them? The, the um, that is a good question, and it is difficult to see because they're in disrepair. They're in great disrepair. Uh, they are double hung windows now, and the uh, vendor tells me that that's part of what's re wrong with them is that they don't operate as of this time. But the existing windows are double hung. The, the problem with replacing double hung windows uh, now is that they are not made to the same specifications. So they would not meet, they would not they might resemble the, the function, but they wouldn't resemble the appearance any longer because that type of window is no longer made in a steel window. And the, and the new window will be double glazed? Did it, did it look that way? Yes, the new, window, the new window will look, look it will match this, the size of the frames. It'll mm -hmm. match the, the horizontal piece, but it will not have the one, the front pane in front of the back pane because that's not that we we the one of the questions landmarks had was can you replicate that, and the answer was no, not in a full function window. Even even in any window, it would be complicated. Um, uh, in any case, but to have an operable window, which is desirable, that is those are the only two operable windows in the facing the front of the uh, of the uh, on that on that level of these of this of this particular assembly. To have them operable, it helps the the uh, ventilation of that of that area. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Renee Cafaro. Um, am I off mute? Yes. Um, so my question, I guess, similar to uh, to Tony's. So it's kind of hard for me to see uh, on the screen and via Google. There seems to be an apartment almost identical to it on the other side of the um, statue. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, do we know, I mean, I assume that's not the same unit. That's got to be a different unit, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, do we know if they've had any work done on their windows? And if so, you know, I just wanted to see if there's a way to match whatever glazing and treatment. So then those two things could be symmetrical. You know, I just want to make sure that whatever we're doing here doesn't somehow throw off balance what from the outside and possibly originally when it was built, um, those might have been one unit, you know, that, that might have been, but it's supposed to be one, um, you know, horizontal visual, um, you know, symmetrical on either side of the statue. So I just want to make sure we're not doing anything that would jeopardize that. Well, that's a very good point. The, uh, they were never joined. Those were two separate oh. apartments. And I don't know what work has been done to that one. That's, and that's where what Landmarks wants to do is to make them all symmetrical and to create a a master plan and the the intent would be to go back to its historic condition so that's the this would be the first step even if they had different if they had different um conditions on different levels 
that's where what that is exactly why landmarks wants there to be a master plan so that when they are replaced they will eventually all look like they the original the historic window currently right now no one has gone into that unit owner has not allowed anyone in to see what the windows are made out of to see if they're the same that no era one's or like if they have a different shine to them or tint or any of that because i mean i live on this street too and i, I know it's been actually not part of the application right now the application okay. is to replace the windows in one apartment and that so now in terms of what the next step for landmarks preservation commission is to if the, is to make a master plan and it would uh, that's, that is a whole other next step that the building has to agree to do. But the first step is to see if they would allow uh, replacing the, uh, the double hung with a casement because using a double hung would, is no longer feasible with current methods of fabrication. Thank you. I, just one quick clarification though. I'm, I'm not saying that we need to have the master plan for this. I understand the application in front of us is just for that apartment. But in order for me to sort of vote on this is that I, I just was hoping to know if we knew with any certainty with the materials that we're voting on tonight, if they would have the same reflection and color and general look. I mean, I do see that it's gonna have like the faux mullions or whatever, so that's good. But um, if it will have the same look as the apartment up yeah. next. So it's just, oh. as long as it looks symmetrical, it's like to that one is that's how I'm gonna sort of understand how I should vote tonight. I'm going to go to another fo to photo to show you. Uh, uh, I apologize. It's 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 <laughs> kind of hard to see on these things. And I hear you. Yeah. Have, um, um, I'm looking for another. Uh, and uh, not well enough, obviously. Um, the 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 windows. We're, I was just looking at a um, picture here. Yeah, it's tough to tell because one has the shades down and one doesn't. So you can't quite see I which one. I keep trying to get this share screen, share screen. It's not, it's not working for some reason. Luke, is there any way you can assist Sarah in sharing her screen? <laughs> he uh, helped me last week and we did fine. Uh, right, Luke? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if there's any link you want me to project, you can just email it to me. I'm um, trying to share a screenshot of the front entrance that you can get Google Gainsborough Studios and get your. I it's on my screen. I just am not able to find it here. Right. Oh, okay. So, so it's I can, sometimes a little bit yeah. difficult um, when you press this share screen button. But after you press share screen. You, you should, uh, is that it? Uh, is that what you're trying to get? Am I on it? I see it. Do you see a photo? Wikipedia? Yeah. Yeah. My point yeah. is, uh, I'm, I'm so sorry if this is just turning That's into okay. <laughs> no, I, I see the photo. Um, that my, my point is, is that the materials chosen here are, are, re are on m most of the floors where the, the, the design of these horizontal window, this, the, the upper level windows are all steel and the casement window below is wood and we are matching those materials basically because those are the historic materials and those are found in other similar configurations. If, they, if I, I can't tell whether that's what's happening on the, it appears that way in the photo that I'm looking at from the Gainsborough Studios, but um, it, I don't know what it is now because it's covered with scaffolding and no one's asked to enter that building. So I understand if it's not, if you, if it's something that you don't feel comfortable under, uh, but, but, but basically the, the materials chosen were chosen to match the historic uh, windows of the building of what, of what would be approved by landmarks. A qu quick follow-up question on that. Um, typically, when uh, you do a, uh, any type of replacement to a facade, LPC is actually asks you to submit uh, samples. Um, have they asked you to submit samples for the material that you're going to use for the windows? No, no, because we're choosing, we're, we use photographs to actually show uh, that we were matching the original type of material, steel, 
and we use drawings to show the existing details and um, to, uh, to establish that we are matching it as closely as possible using current manufacturing. We showed um, finishes, the, the finish is matching the existing paint color that is, has been established as historic. So it's, um, that is the, they did not ask to see samples of the, okay. of the materials. And, but, you, but you did submit photographs uh, in situ with, uh, you know, both the original material and your proposed replacement next to each other so that they can see that it is similar. Yes. Okay, yes. do you have these photographs and are you able okay. to share those with us? The, the photograph presentation that I keep trying to get back on to here is what um, is the presentation that I made to- uh, Okay, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try to walk you through this. After you press the share screen button, don't worry about selecting all of those other windows. Just uh, click the first window. It should just say screen. And that should be the only share screen you should have to choose. Um. Uh, am I, can you hear me? Because my, now my, can you hear me? Yes, we can, yes, hear, we can you. hear you. And okay. we, can, we can see some drawings. Yes, that is, th these are the original drawings. And these in combination, these show you the profiles. Uh, and in terms of what Landmarks requires for, as long as they're wood and they appear like wood and we show a painted finish, like the original painted finish, do you, have, but do you have this visual? Do you have the painted finish yes. um, next to the existing window? No. And did you did LPC ask you to submit that? No, they did not. They didn't. They didn't ask you to submit one little piece of metal next to the existing. No, they did not. Hmm. Um, okay, that's <laughs> Surprising. I mean, it is a very standard uh, request that they have for pretty much anything, whether it's a uh, brick, mortar, uh, uh, repointing, uh, stone, and anything. You usually have to take your little photograph one next to the other. I showed they. We showed photographs of the windows as I had in that. Um, in that, let me find the other. Try to find the other. Uh, oh boy, I'm going to go crazy. Sorry. I've now lost my ability to get, okay, now here's a way to get out of it. All right. There we go. Share screen. Uh, and share. And you as are you able to see these photos yes we are this was these photographs showing the that that the fit the the what the vendor this it was the vendor who put who provided me with these materials and they showed me what were uh considered his historic uh the original paint finish and that they were matching it, and Landmarks accepted that using using these photos. So, can you can you show us your your proposed window? Yes. Okay. I'll go back to. Um, These are the pictures of the- I'm, I'm not asking for a drawing. I'm asking for the actual window or a sample of it, or you know, what, what, what is the window itself and, and its frame going to look like? Do you have a visual of that? The, I, do not have a picture of the, I do not have a rendering of the window. I do not. Um, so Hope's windows are considered a, a sort of a, a, a typical window that is chosen in this sort of, uh, this sort of uh, application for what are considered uh, close to looking, they're often used to replace windows, steel windows in the early part of 
uh, the 20th century. And in the, in the catalog from the manufacturer or I there's don't. no photo? There's, there's no I photo. I do not that have that. Can... No, I don't. But I hear you. I will. Okay, so uh, I, Renee, uh, d does that answer your your question? It was a long. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I appreciate you guys going through all that. I mean, it's it is what it is, and you know, I know. I mean, I, I live down the street. You can't see it because of the scaffold. So I mean, and I can't see it from Google Maps and stuff like that either because of the scaffolding. So it's, it is kind of hard to tell it's, if we can't. Yeah. But, yeah, but you're right. We usually, if we were in person, would have like a sample of the metal and, and the glass to kind of hold. So, um, but if I could just ask now before I forget if this could be somehow on record that, um, you know, I'll be happy to deal with the voting for this or whatever, but I just want the glazing issue um, to be noted that we uh, that maybe it might physically look the same in all the drawings, but we want to make sure that effectively it looks the same, it has the same tint and the same shine because we know that glass a lot of times when it's replaced looks wildly different when the light hits it. So I don't know how we incorporate that, but given the circumstances, but I appreciate you guys doing the best you can to sort of answer the question without you know the materials. Okay, yeah, very good point, thank you. Uh, next question is from Barbara. Thank you. Um, I, so it, it sort of, uh, piggybacks on some of the things that you were talking about before. I just wondered, because uh, you're proposing to change the operation of the window, um, any other windows, um, have they changed from double hungs to a casement window? Um, I can't see that. I don't know the full what the full facade looks at like at this time. I can see that some have been changed from a double hung to a single pane. I don't know if they're operable. I don't know if it's a tilt and turn type. But I can see on some of the photographs that that we've looked at that that has that's a difference from uh, uh, from the original window, and I I would assume that landmarks would uh, would want them to be restored to double hung if there were a master plan in place. Right, except that you're not you're not um, doing it to double hung. No, and they're, well, they're not part. Well, that they're. I'm sorry. Well, let me show you the windows. I'm talking about um i'm talking about the narrow windows that we're talking yeah. about now. no i'm not some of them have changed them actually to single pane so that they look all the same and one of landmark's first questions to me was what are the, we it took it it took some time to find out what is the earliest rendition it, and it's a challenge on any project it's not I guess, out my, what, I guess my question isn't so much about um is it, you know, are you going back to the original? My question more is that you're going to have one window that can that can open out or open in, I guess, depending on how it operates. Um, but all the other windows will operate. It, it will look like an anomaly. Actually, I actually I don't see, I, we couldn't find any of the existing windows as double hung. They seem to have been replaced by either casements or what appear to be what our casement window will look like, which is a one over one configure in the same plane. I'm just talking about the operation. So right. because my, my, my question really has to do with how the building looks when the, when the window is open. I, I understand that when they're closed, everything looks the same. It's right. the, when the, I, no, like, the, I like the, to open my windows. So, you know. Going back to that question, that particular, yeah. that type of window I cannot find any others that appear to be double hung. So they all look like they're either single pane or a casement pane with one over one, what we're proposing to do. I don't- okay, see But, but you don't hung. know if they open out or they open in or- No, I don't. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just to clarify on, on that. So what you're saying is that currently there are no double hung windows on the building and but there are casement windows but that's that's where there are many different window types and that of the windows that we're talking about those two end windows in the narrow uh selection i could not find in the photographs more current photographs that i've seen any that appeared to be double hung i don't know what they are now but that is my impression that none are double hung as far as i can tell from the photographs that i've seen Okay, although the, the photographs that you have shown us from a 
uh, non-determined uh, year that is really recent uh, suggests that they certainly look like double hung. They may be fixed panels or they may be casement. They're closed, so we can't really tell what is the opening mechanism, but they certainly look like. No, no they the don't panel. look double hung. That double hung has a distinct shadow and the windows that I've seen in the more current photographs appear to be in the same plane, unlike a double hung window. I can show you that the picture that I'm referring to, if it'll, it'll take a second. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just having a little bit of trouble finding this. Hang on a second. It's, um, can you see the pictures here? Yes, we can. Okay. This pic, this, this one, I'm going to yeah. zoom in on these. You can see in these appear to be in the same plane. This appears to be, these are two single panels. They are certain, that is certainly in the same plane. In this case, it's been, it seems to have something built in front of it with two thicker mullions. But again, those two end windows appear to be a single panel. Up here, this level, it's a single panel. And on this level, it's got a strong horizontal bar that may or may not indicate double hung. I would say that is one double hung, uh, but going up again here. So I, um, you can see th these are single pane, single, a single panel. At one point, Landmarks want, uh, thought that we would, wondered if we would consider making it single panel and inoperable, and that's the pushback was we want them to, okay, here's up here is another what could be double hung, but single panel, single panel, double hung, double hung. So we've got a few double hung, most of them are single panel. And that is here, I think that the windows here are, this is the apartment in question. And of course, this is an important, um, level because it's closest to the sidewalk but uh but the the apartment next to it appears to have all windows with a horizontal if i'm re reading the reflection correctly it's hard to say so it's been a, a, a mixture of changes but um uh, okay all right Th thank you for the this clarification that was actually really very helpful yeah um barbara does that answer your question it does. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Now we have a question uh, from uh, Dave Achilles. Uh, yes. I was just wondering if we get the, we decide on the casement movement, it would be internal. They would open up inwards like the wooden windows do, right? That's actually a very difficult um, manufacturing technique. Most, most current windows are outswinging in terms of, and, and that these included. The proposed window is an outswinging casement. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Suzanne. So Suzanne. I just, yeah, so um, obviously the building has um, gone through a great effort to um, restore the facade. And what you're saying is that it seems as though they're wanting to move forward to maintain the integrity of the facade top to bottom because the windows were so integral to what this studio represents. The, the light itself was what was um, the value of this as an artist studio. And I know that it's apparent that, and I read in some of the records that these windows have been replaced in the past. Um, there's not a lot of details around that. And I don't know why there isn't more information on them trying to follow some type of um, structure that would make it all more uniform on the outside. Yeah. But were you, um, was the owner 
or anybody who buys into a building like this because it is landmarked, have they not articulated to you any interest in um, providing you with information on what the other tenants feel? Is there a board that has a perspective on trying to move forward doing this in a more uniform way? Because if these windows are going to roll out and some of them lift up and down, then the contextually this whole facade of the building is going to change um, or look non-uniform. Has anyone been able to help you with trying to um, get some clarification around um, getting this approved? No, <laughs> no. I think the timeline didn't really allow for that, and yeah. I, I would, I would appreciate that. Uh, what you know, offices that might used to have people going to them just might not be happening, and right. might not be reading their emails. But the time frame of this happened very quickly, so I appreciate these questions and I appreciate your patience, all of you with this. I'm a, I'm, I'm, I was, this is the only apartment in question is apartment four. And it's uh, the window vendor himself who asked me for my assistance in creating this application. And it has now turned into one aspect of it needing this, uh, this, yeah. uh, this approval because of the function. It's um, right. So Sarah, and you, what you were saying is that landmarks had no problem with the fact that when we look at these, um, the layout, you don't have to pull it back up unless you want to, um, but they spoke about this exterior paint job, um, the color being a Benjamin Moore yeah. HC114. I guess that's what's been used throughout the building with this vendor. Um, and also the fact that the area of the glass itself will change. These panels will go, um, the panels in question will be thicker or wider, um, and then the um, other panels that are more permanent um, will also change in size. So I'm wondering, aside from, but or, or are you saying that landmarks did not have a problem with that? Because I would imagine that would make the glass area a bit smaller than what we're seeing. Um, yes. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. It's not. It's not at all unusual for current for windows to be slightly smaller, uh, glass area to be reduced. They have a, a landmark sort of has a rule of thumb that if anything changes by, um, depending on the element by either a quarter of an inch or an inch, then they'll they'll bring it to question. And there was uh, in the application at an earlier phase, there was a, um, a one design feature that uh, the went, vendor agreed to remove completely because it was not part of the historic window and landmark said, we, can we, can, can you make this window without that piece? So I understand, but then we, we kept on honing it down to getting the pieces smaller to match as closely as possible. But when you, when you have uh, current manufacturing methods and you're adding insulated glass, that's your slightly larger within the, but the tolerance is acceptable to landmarks. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions by uh, members of the committee? Okay, so seeing none, um, I will open up the floor to members of the public. Uh, do we have any members of the public uh, in attendance who wish to speak um, on this matter? All right, seeing none. I uh, just want to make sure, members of the committee, any uh, last minute, last second questions? No questions? Okay, so we're going to move to business session. During business session, members of the, uh, the committee discuss the matter, we make comments, and then uh, we will make a motion. Um, okay, so uh, raise your hands if you have uh, comments. Uh, Dave Achilles. Yeah, well, this is very tough. It would be a lot easier if there were a master plan, but it's not the applicant's fault that there isn't. And we haven't gotten a whole lot of headway or movement from the LPC on this. So I'm, I'm, it's a conundrum. Um, the best possible solution that will look historic using historic fabric doesn't operate historically as it is a casement window as opposed to a up and down window. So it's a real conundrum. I mean, this is a pickle. The applicant is doing the best they can. I'm gonna to have to listen to your opinion before I can make my, my decision on this. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, I, I would just uh, make a very quick sort of like general uh, comment to uh, to frame this this discussion. Um, I think that everybody rec recognizes that a master plan would really be the way to go. Now, you cannot force uh, an entity that is not the applicant to come up with a master plan. So the, the applicant is in this instance is the uh, owner of one unit in the building and we cannot compel the board of the building to agree to producing a master plan. That being said, given that this is the more recent application for a window replacement in this building, that suggests that going LPC would treat this alteration as the master plan. So although there is no master plan in essence and in, uh, you know, by, by way of implication and precedent, this is the master plan. So in, you know, we, we have to look at it and it may be, I mean, if we like it, we may decide that it's good. If we don't like it, we may decide it's not good. But overall, um, you know, we cannot force uh, anyone to do alterations to their buildings. Uh, but when these decision, decisions are being made to alter, you know, to replace the windows, then uh, this is the default design that LPC would, uh, would recommend and approve. So we just have to keep that in mind. Uh, although, you know, it is, it is a, you know, very small uh, scale of, of a proposal, the implications are actually much broader. So just wanted to, uh, to point that out. Okay, other comments by members of uh, the committee. Uh, Tony. Uh, yeah, you know, it's interesting with this application, um, I think we're seeing something a little bit different than we typically do. A lot of applicants sacrifice materials, first thing. Uh, we always get pushed into dealing with aluminum, uh, going from wood to aluminum, going from original metal to aluminum. Um, this is interesting because they're, and I know it's not part of, of this full application, but they're changing the wood window to a wood window. They're changing the steel windows to a steel window, which I think is fantastic. Something we definitely do not see that often, especially steel, because this is not all that common. So I'm pretty impressed with that. Suzanne and I were doing some research on it uh, when, uh, a couple of days ago. And similar to Sarah's conclusion, looking at the exterior, it did appear, and, and I guess I, I don't know for sure either, it did appear that some of those side windows on the upper floors were up down uh, windows, uh, one over one windows. And if that is the case, and again, it seems like nobody knows for sure, if that is the case, this is almost a win in all directions. Um, but at the very least, I'm thrilled to see the materials and the look is identical to the historic photo. And I just think that's fantastic. Uh, other comments? on uh, this application. Uh, we have uh, Suzanne. Suzanne, do you wanna make a comment? Yeah, I just was also gonna say that um, I think we are lacking a little bit of information. I think that Sarah has not been given um, you know, a lot of input from, um, I know that she made the, went to the trouble to see if somebody from the board or if the actual owner could be there so they could speak to, you know, some of the reasoning behind this. You know, obviously we've run into this before and you guys have for years when you have a beautiful building like this, um, but they, but the glass is too thin. So it's, you know, too hot, you know, uh, and then it's too cold and they have to, we want to make sure that these buildings that people want to continue to live there and maintain them and care about them. And so the modernization of it is not, you know, unheard of. And I think that it seems like they're trying to do their due diligence. I just feel badly that Sarah hasn't been given more information from the building in terms of if they had spent a couple of years ago, a great deal of money um, fixing up the, um, the beautiful frieze, the statue, all the terracotta work. They obviously seem to be a building dedicated to wanting to maintain because it is such a unique building that they would it's too bad that we don't know something about the building's position on that this would be something that they'd like to see moving forward. 
Um, and, you know, I just wanted to speak to them on behalf of Sarah, because I know that she was trying to get other people here who may have been able to um, help us understand what the plan is for this building, what these other windows do. I do know that um, there was replacement windows. Um, they don't know, we don't know that this is the original glass, but it actually may be original glass. Um, from I went, I did some research and four may be the one of the last original. I think seven was one of the last original. And I think every other window in the building has been replaced. Looks like they tried to do something uniform, but um, in terms of the glare, um, but more, moreover, how these windows open or don't is the only thing that I'm sort of concerned about. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, Karen. Yeah, I just wanted to add a comment about the Hope's windows. I know we had questions to see samples. And um, just from my background, I want to let you know that I have experience with Hope's windows and they're really like top notch, best in class. Their company's been around for over a hundred years. They're really um, very high performing and all handcrafted. So they're, they're not sparing any expense and care in specifying Hope's as a window. Okay, Th thank you, that's, that, that's helpful. Um, do we have other comments by uh, members of the committee? Any more uh, comments? Um, Barbara. I just wanted to add that, um, you know, I was, I feel a little better about this in that it's such a hodgepodge right now. And um, it seems like all of the, you know, maybe the, some of the, I mean, I would have liked it to be a double hung window in the spirit of the original, but um, if this were the, if, if many others still had the double hung, I think I might feel a little differently about it. I'm sort of, you know, wavering a little bit more. Um, and like the others, I appreciate the quality and, and also the adherence to the original material. So this is a tough one, it's not very clear. Yeah. Um, do we have any other uh, comments? I don't see any raised hands. Uh, yes, I do. Uh, and uh, it just disappeared. Uh, who raised their hand? Mm -hmm. Sorry, bear with me. Uh, uh, Suzanne, and, Suzanne and John are both have their hands raised. Uh, John, let's go. Yeah. To John. Uh, I'll try to make this a comment. Um, 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 as opposed to a question, uh, but I, I, I guess I would like to uh, get a sense from the committee. If, if I'm understanding that the applicant is saying a double hung window is not doable. So if we deny the application, uh, and let's assume that's supported by LPC, wh wh what's the default? What, what happens in that case? Um, if, if we're are we accepting that what the applicant is saying that in fact a double hung window is not doable? Um, so, uh, although it's a question, I will I will try to uh, to address it. Um, we are uh, told by the applicant that um, a a double hung window is not doable. Um, now, the extent of what that means is unclear, uh, you know, does that mean that it cannot be done by this particular manufacturer? Does it mean that um, it doesn't exist in a, uh, you know, stand? Could a, uh, you know, a craftsman uh, somewhere in this country or another country be able to uh, custom make a, uh, a window uh, that would fit the, uh, the, the criteria? You know, it, it is not impossible, right? So right now, to the best of the representation of uh, of our understanding of the representation of the uh, of the applicant, it is not uh, it is not feasible. But could uh, you know further exploration be made? Uh, certainly, it could. Um, definite answer, uh, you know, to to the the question of whether that particular type of window, the way it exists, 
uh, can, you know, whether it can be replicated or not. But certainly right now, the applicant is representing to us that it cannot be replicated. And, you know, what they're proposing is this particular uh, treatment. Now, maybe there is another type of more appropriate. Uh, but once again, you know, we're not in the business of, you know, figuring out what all the options could be. We have an application that is in front of us. The application is for a casement window. And, uh, you know, this is what we are uh, weighing in. Now, you know, if, if we were to decide that we don't like it, um, then the applicant has a number of options. You know, they, certainly the fixed panel is a possibility. I don't know that we would necessarily like it more than what is in front of us, but you know, like other options uh, could be uh, explored. But once again, you know, what we are looking at is what is in front of us. And, uh, you know, if we uh, make the determination that we don't like it, it is just simply to say that we don't like this particular treatment. It is not to say that, uh, you know, we are, uh, we have exhausted every possibility for, for a window replacement. So, um, you know, I think we just have to stick with what is in front of us um, and really, you know, try to weigh in to the best of, the type of comments that we can make on, uh, you know, whether this uh, proposal is, is uh, you know, satisfactory or not. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I see that uh, Dave uh, Achilles has uh, raised his hand. Dave, go ahead. Okay, just, just from my point of view right now, I'm at the place where I would do a motion for approval with a lot of caveats with a lot of attachments to it. That's where I'm standing at the moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I see that uh, Suzanne has her hand up. Suzanne, do you wish to uh, comment further? Yeah, I just wanted to comment and thanks Dave on that. And also Karen, thanks for the input on on the windows, you know, just the val you know, that these are top of the line windows. Um, I think that it would lacking the information of the budget, Terry, perhaps um, direction that this is taking is it? Is it? Um, I know that we've been told that if these can't be made, is it? Was that? Is that budget driven? Um, and that's why they went to this. They obviously are going to a top of a line manufacturer, but is the notion of custom not possible? Um, and then I'm just wondering, also lacking. This is just a lacking information. This is I'm sort of going down the path of the information that we have and maybe some of the information that we would like to see would be how the um, how the windows with their new size um, appear like a before and after, um, not just the look of the materials themselves, but how the facade with these new panels, with the new size of the glass, um, albeit much smaller size, but the fact that the um, seven panels um, that are larger, and then the two on the ends um, that are thinner, that iteration will change and um, there will be there will be more balanced looking. What will that look like in ratio to the rest of the, um, the windows in the facade? That's what I would be, um, I'm just throwing out there, that would be some, a bit of information that I would like to know. Um, a, a quick clarification. So as uh, Sarah explained, um, LPC does have um, a rule on how they appreciate the uh, reduction in the glazing. So uh, typically, if the reduction in glazing is uh, less than 5%, um, it, is, it, it is under the purview of the staff to make here, there, there will be, and you know, we uh, in the proposal submitted by Sarah, there is going to be a slight reduction in uh, in glazing because the uh, the frame of the uh, the window is slightly uh, wider, um, but it doesn't rise to the level of uh, being under the purview of the commissioners. Uh, be approved by staff, which is not to say that we should not comment on it, but it gives you a idea of the, the scale of this uh, of this reduction. It is um, it is considered 
uh, not significant to the point of raising uh, you know, the, the concern of the full uh, commission of the, uh, the, the commissioners. Um, we have also to uh, keep in mind once again, you know, that uh, so specifically for this application, we know, uh, you know, it is close to the street. So, you know, the visual impact is more direct and most likely this would become the master plan and therefore it would uh, affect the uh, but right now, as it is uh, drawn, um, it is under the threshold that would, uh, you know, bump this to a, a fuller review reduction. Um, okay, so do we have any further uh, comments on, uh, on this uh, proposal? I, I do. Uh, who is? It's Mike. Mike. Okay, Mike, go ahead. So I just counted the number of windows in the uh, orange frame, the, the checker, the, the apartment in question. And then I counted the number of windows in the building, in the apartment just to the left of that, just to the east of that. And it's a different number. There's that particular apartment has only eight sections, while every other one that I counted in the building has nine. <laughs> how, how would they make that into a, a master plan when, when one of the uh, windows is just, just uh, one set, just one apartment is totally different? We have nine panels in our- have nine, but if you look at the, uh, uh, the apartment on the same level, just to the east of yours, I'm counting eight. You tell me if you agree. Yeah, so uh, M Mike, we're actually no longer, I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to address it very quickly. Um, if you look at the uh, photographs of the building, uh, the fenestration is actually nine panels. Why the, um, the uh, windows to the, uh, to the east only have eight uh, is, Certainly a question, but we don't have the answer to that question right now. And what is in front of us is what is within the uh, red dotted lines. And uh, we're going to uh, stick to that. And as you can see, this is really the important part because this is consistent with the fenestration of the other windows uh, in the building. As Sarah explained, uh, it is a hodgepodge currently. You know, when the windows have been replaced, uh, they have been replaced before designation. Some windows have been replaced after designation. What kind of review uh, was, uh, you know, uh, the, the owners had to uh, undergo when they did the replacement after designation remains unclear. We know that uh, there was a, a DOB uh, permit that was issued in 1995. The building was designated in 19... Um, we don't have a record of the uh, LPC approval in 1995, uh, simply because uh, LPC doesn't have digital uh, files that go uh, that way back. But, you know, obviously it uh, underwent... So the very long answer is we, we don't know, but what is in front of us is this window the set of windows, they are original. And um, this is the type of fenestration that, you know, if a master plan were to uh, come in place, this is what the rest of the building would revert to. Right. Okay. Um, other uh, comments? I don't see any raised hands. Yes, Dave, Akil. Well, I was going to make a motion for approval if Suzanne would add some of what we have been talking about to this situation. Um, yes, I will. Do, do we, do we, is, do, do I consider that as a motion? Do we have a motion to, uh, Dave, do we? Yes, I was making a motion to approve with added caveats to the motion. And what would be these caveats? The I idea that the applicant, <laughs> it's, it's tough, that the applicant uh, 
expresses a concern about a master plan. We're always talking about master plans. And uh, other than that, I, I, I don't know what to add. I think it's a good plan overall. And what we've been given with, I think they've done a good job. The choices between using the original materials or the casement, I mean, we couldn't get both. And I think the idea of using the original materials, as Tony pointed out, is really good. The look will be the same. If that was my apartment, I would want casement windows with the original materials. So I make a motion to approve, and I'm sure people will have something more to add to it, but that's to get the ball rolling. Okay, all right. Um, so do we have a second to this motion? Second. Second. Okay, all right, so we have a motion. The motion is to approve. Um, and uh, this motion is accompanied by uh, concerns about a master plan. Is it, do, do I have that correctly? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, do we have any, uh, so I see that Buzz has his hand up. Buzz, do you have a comment to the motion? You know, my comment is a question to you, how to make this language for this particular application reflect, get back to LPC to what we really want is a master plan. It's a language question and I count on you to do it. Okay, and the, Point, the language is very simple, and it is exactly what you just said, Buzz. And we <laughs> encourage LPC to produce a, a master plan, yes. or, or to uh, demand that any follow-up window replacement in that particular building follows a master plan. Yes. That Does, does that address your, your yes, uh, it does. question? Yes, I think everybody okay. does. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so we have a motion, we have a second. Uh, do we have any further questions or comments to the motion? <laughs> okay, so seeing none, just to reiterate, we, are, uh, go we have a motion to approve, uh, which means that we are in favor of a casement window on uh, each side um, with uh, using the original material, uh, which is uh, steel, using uh, a color that is consistent with uh, the existing color of uh, the windows. And uh, we are urging LPC to uh, uh, compel the uh, board of the building to uh, create a master plan uh, that would become the norm for any for uh, follow-up window replacement in any other. Uh... Yes, great. This will be our uh, final vote of the evening. Uh, Rene Kefaro. Yes. Uh, Dave. Yes. Uh, Buzz. Yes. James. Yes. Sarah. Yes. Uh, Laura. Okay, Laura is not with us. Uh, John. Yes. Nick. Okay, Nick is not with us. Suzanne. Yes. Mike. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Renee Kitsala. Yes. Sam? Yes. Uh, Lucas? <laughs> Lucas? Uh, okay, Chuck? Yes. Uh, Janet? Yes. Karen? My vote is yes. Thank you. Uh, Barbara? Yes. Tony? Yes. And let me go back to Lucas. Okay, I think Lucas stepped out. Um, okay, so, uh, and I'm a yes. So it's a uh, unanimous vote in favor uh, with uh, all the caveats that we uh, have spelled out. And this is a uh, unanimous vote. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, once again, welcome uh, our new members. Um, I'm not sure that they were able to stay for the, um, mm -hmm. the full session. It was only uh, one of the interesting ones. We're having uh, broader issues and concerns than really 
front of us, uh, which is always what makes this uh, committee uh, so much fun. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, your participation. Thank you to the applicant. I know that presenting from uh, a, a Zoom platform is not the easiest and the most uh, conducive, especially when we're so used to, you know, the sort of tactile file feel of, you know, seeing the uh, the samples but um i think that we were able to uh get all the important information on this uh this presentation so uh thank you very much for uh your effort in this uh difficult time and i think on you. that note um uh let's adjourn the meeting thank you so much thank you Layla. Bye, thank Bye, Layla. Have, have a good evening thank you thank you Bye. thanks everyone thank you